This episode is brought to you by IQ Bar. Now get 20% off every IQ Bar product plus free shipping when you text FILES, F-I-L-E-S, to 64000. And why you should do that is because IQ Bar is the best bar in the game. I mean it. I've tried so many different ones. And IQ Bar genuinely so good. Tastes great. It has all of the stuff I need to get me through my day. I want a snack that is going to keep me alert and boosted and I'm not going to have some crash later on. IQ Bar absolutely does that. I keep them in my car because no matter if someone is keto, vegan, paleo, gluten-free, soy-free, any of the things, I know that I can be like, hey, I have a snack for you. It's an IQ Bar and it's going to fill you up and it's going to taste great. Now you can get 20% off all IQ Bar products plus free shipping. To get your 20% off, just text FILES, F-I-L-E-S, to 64000. Get your discount now. That's right. Text FILES, F-I-L-E-S, to 64000. That's FILES to 64000. Message and data rates may apply. See terms for details. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another special edition of the Vowel Files Going Deeper Edition, episode number 600. A round of applause, everyone. <laughs> With us is the household of Ali, Amanda, and Derek, and our pop culture correspondent, Natalie Joy, is with us. How are you doing, babe? I'm doing lovely. How lovely. are you? Natalie's feeling a little under the weather, so yeah. but she's dedicated to the pop culture that we deliver to this show. So we we appreciate her dedication. I watched her lock eyes with Kiki as you were going through your names because I'm pretty sure the last time you were here, you were like, Hey, why don't you introduce Kiki? You're like, that's so rude. Yeah. I feel like you should add Kiki into your household. Okay, hi Kiki. Kiki and her Nick have a me. very like distant but respectful We respect each other. Yeah. Yeah. She gets a piece of his turkey sandwich. And that it's keeps her coming day. back for chicken. more. It's yeah. a chicken sandwich. A chicken. Well, also, I just want to take the time to say thank you all. I mean, 600 episodes, you know, I know we, we pop them out like, like what? Like candy? I don't know. Like babies? Mm, that's a lot of babies. Shit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ow. <laughs> no, seriously, though, I mean, the show's been, it, it literally is, is, is more popular than ever. I mean, listen, every time we have one of these, you know, 500, 600, it's, I, I just want to, you know, express how, how Gra- grateful. I want to express my gratitude and how grateful I am for, for all the people listening. Uh, to still be one of the fastest growing podcasts out there is super cool, uh, especially given just how how long we've been around. And you know, we obviously have y'all to thank. And uh, hopefully you, you keep on listening and tell your friends. And we always appreciate the ways that you support the show and, and advocate for it and promote it for us. It, it means a lot. And uh, without y'all, uh, we wouldn't be able to do what we love. So, thanks. Uh, we have a very special guest. The one, the only, Justin Long is, returns to be our guest. He was our 200th guest. So, he's back for another anniversary. It's great to have Justin. As you can expect, it's an amazing conversation. But before we get to Justin, what, what do we have to get into? Did you guys see that video of BB Rexa getting a phone? I, I heard is about it. it? I didn't see the video. BB. Oh, BB. BB. Yeah, BB. Getting that. a phone, like, chucked at her. On stage? Yes. Mm-hmm. I'm assuming the guy got arrested? Yeah. He he's... got arrested. And, like, just very recently, it was revealed that, I guess, he wanted her to take a photo with his phone. You know how well, sometimes people will do that, yeah. like, throw a phone on stage and, like, get them to take a selfie? Yeah, I doubt he was trying to do it to, like, actually harm her, but that is, so like... So he threw her his phone to, to take a... So that she would take a selfie with his phone and toss it back yeah. was his intent. And instead yeah. nailed her in the face and caused her to get stitches, I believe. Is yeah. she pressing charges? I mean, he's clearly in police custody. So, like, if you found out if it was an accident, like, doesn't that change? Yeah. I mean, she- I think there's, like, this huge thing about, like, because a, a while back I was seeing people at Harry Styles concerts. Yeah, like, hit in the nuts once. People threw, like candy at him and it like hit his eye like it's crazy shit people are throwing at singers and like expecting them to have fun with it and it's like no you're first of all like that yeah, they could slip on that or like you could hit them and hurt them like why are you throwing shit at them like that seems just so disrespectful maybe they need to make an example of this guy i think it like it follows a common thread of like people just getting way too comfy and entitled with like anybody who's like famous i mean or has she, any like, kind of notoriety deck like hit the ground. Did that stop the concert? Um, I mean, have. in the video I saw, she kind of like almost tried to walk it off and then just like hit the ground. And then you could see like team members from like in the wings, like come out to check on her and make sure she was OK. Like clearly she was not. She left. Yeah, yeah. she left the show. 
damn. Yeah. That guy must have felt like a dick. And it's like you can't even be like, oh, it wasn't me because like it's, it's your a phone. picture it's your of you phone. on your lock screen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, is this your dog? Yeah. <laughs> Does it unlock with your, your face? face ID? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh my That's God. That's the damning evidence. Uh, and uh, Harry, uh, Harry and Meghan. Are coming under fire again. You love to, you hate to see it. You love I mean, to see it. <laughs> Megan's podcast archetypes got dropped from Spotify. So she had like a, a 20, People's Choice nominee. She had like a $25 million <laughs> deal with a Spotify. And now it's coming out that she never actually even interviewed her guests. And like the questions that the guests were asked were actually asked by a producer. And then Megan would go in solo and just like record things herself. No. Do pickups? That's what, like, because some of the guests Come are posting, that, like, is that true? I so enjoyed my time. Thanks to Blank for being a great interviewer. And it's not Megan. It's someone on her team. They're, so like, someone crediting... else would read the questions yeah. and then they would answer the questions and then Megan would come in and record her asking the Apparently questions? that's what people are saying. No. Because yeah. they, they thanked other people for being good interviewers and that person wasn't Megan. And she wasn't having nobodies. I mean, I know they, I feel like they promised... When that when that show that podcast came out, they the I feel like the expectation was that she was going to have other like heads of state, the Oprah Winfrey's of the yeah. world, the not that, not that Oprah's a head of state, but like you know Michelle Obama, you know truly like world. To be famous. fair, I mean I think it's not a huge stretch that she wasn't based on just like the structure of her podcast. She would do these main You're interviews. Defend this? No, but listen to the structure. So it'd be like she'd do an interview, let's say with like. Serena Williams and mm -hmm. then she'd have a moment where she's like she'll do this voiceover and she'll say I began wondering where like this word came from and where as a society we started doing this so I decided to ask professor of blah 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 from NYU here's what she had to say okay. so you know what I mean those were always separate clips so does Megan herself need to be the one getting on zoom with this professor at NYU and getting does she her need response? to no but it just yeah. comes across as so inauthentic inauthentic and they definitely don't let people know they do this, right? Like they don't promote this. This is not something that is common knowledge. We're all having this kind of like, really response. And what the fuck else is she doing? You Being know? Mother? Yeah, I understand. Yeah. But, but she's also got all this money and privilege and I'm sure nannies and given all this money to do this show and she can't even show up for it. Well, Kelly Osborne might agree with you because she called Prince Harry a fucking twat. Wow. Is what she said. Why is twat such a bad word? Everyone's what fucking is... life is hard. <laughs> you were the prince of a goddamn country, is what she said. Yeah. He's a whining, complaining, woe is me. I'm the only one that's ever had mental problems. My life is hard. They were coming more and more unlikable. You know? At, listen, they, they called the press on themselves and clearly tried to pitch a story about the paparazzi, hoping that they would the endear their audience and and compare it to you know princess diana's death and it worked for about eight hours until yeah, it's still working on me you, you're a big fan yeah you don't think you don't have any i don't see like the really big issue that everyone has with them i don't have an i, I don't really I, I i don't really care i find them to be insufferable and boring I don't really care. I just find them to be insufferable. <laughs> They're and the boring. worst. They're the most privileged people in the world, and they complain a lot. The thing is, is that their whole point, though, is that like there is a media narrative that is like so twisted that has like forever poisoned like the public's image of them. Like whether you believe that or not, like that very premise is that like anything that comes out is kind of like just like fuels this narrative of like the media has always had this like. In like very intense bias against them. that might be true but i always had a positive opinion of them until i started paying attention and watching their documentaries and consuming their content and then i started to be annoyed by them so i don't know from afar i always found them to be likable and and kind of uh, america's versions of 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 king and queen and then i watched the documentary and i felt like they were just really privileged complainers which they do have some valid things to complain about like what like the stories that they spread about her and her them sitting outside of her mother's home and like yeah, they no, did I, some terrible things to her I, it's hard to feel sorry for them uh, yeah they're just dump trucks of money backed up on their front lawn and that they, doesn't mean their problems aren't real no i just it's just hard to empathize with people who have 
an incredible amount of privilege and and the thing they do most of is complain. Me personally, I have a hard time. I mean, I guess that just goes to prove that like money doesn't make you happy. True. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I know it's, you know, we've covered the fact that Kim Cattrall is coming back to And Just Like That for uh, reportedly just doing something without the rest of the cast. And it's going to be at the very end of the entire season two. Kind of like Meghan Markle's voiceovers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> totally. <laughs> Makes an impact, not really the meat of it. <laughs> um, but Michael Patrick King, the writer and director, was quoted as saying he didn't know why Kim Cattrall came back. And it really did make me curious. Like, why did she come back? I, and I guess the obvious answer is like, maybe they offered her a ton of money. But it seemed like, I don't know, I feel like Kim Cattrall could get her back elsewhere. Maybe not. Maybe she felt like she owed it to the fans of Sex in the City. There like you go. That her, she didn't feel like her out was appropriate and like she understood the fans frustration when they're just like where the fuck is samantha Mm -hmm. like okay she's she's in la she like sent flowers to big's funeral like okay i guess so she probably was like you know what they they deserve something more so i'm gonna show up for like four seconds well i do think she kind of got the best of both worlds in that case because we really got to see how much samantha adds to the show because i feel like that was and granted maybe we were just looking for a scapegoat for why this revival like wasn't what we hoped for but i do think we really got to appreciate samantha now that she was gone i missed her i missed that sass yeah yeah cindy lopper has not been inducted into the rock hall of fame yet and she was quoted as saying i don't need a badge and i'm just curious like if you were if there were a whatever. Did someone ask her about it or did she bring it up? So she was on the list of nominees this year and then was not on the list of inductees. Oh. So I think that's like kind of the pertinence of it right now. I am the last person to ask about music and history of it, but she seems fairly iconic. Yeah. I feel like she deserves a spot. Absolutely. She's iconic. She she had definitely her day. It reminds me of when like Celine Dion was left off that like Rolling Stone yes. top 100 artists of all time list. That's and insane. It, yeah. And it's like if you're one of these artists who's like a mega superstar, uncontested history making person, and then you get passed over for like one of the accolades. Like, is there anything you can say without sounding My either like favorite- petty my favorite musician who handles this well, I think, is actually Jimmy Buffett because he produce. you know what I mean? He creates music that is never, it's not really like the nominated for the Grammys. You don't see him at these like bigger events, but he's like thriving down in Key West. And I feel like he's done interviews before where he's like, no, I'm good. Like he almost doesn't need that to prove that his music is good and impactful and he has great fans. He, well, Jimmy Buffett definitely doesn't. But I yeah, guess maybe I just one, think it's cool. I guess, yeah, sure. Like he's kind of a timeless person who still performs. I don't know if he still does, but he he still does. Yeah, and when if he does, he still sells out. Like he's yes. still a draw, oh, yeah. right? Oh yeah. And I don't know when the last time Cindy's been performing, so I could see why maybe it might mean more to someone like her than Jimmy, who's just like, I get validation anytime I walk outside, you know. And maybe it's just not the same for Cindy anymore so I could I can understand yeah that. maybe she just wants that as like a feather in her cap but yeah. it sounds like maybe she doesn't it sounds like she's like ah f the noise although you kind of have to say that you know no matter how much you do want it you it's can't like when yeah. you're not like, asked back you can't to say you're in paradise you're like I, I didn't want to go I sometimes like it when people are just like you know what it would have meant a lot to me and I'm disappointed I didn't get it you yeah know? Amy like, Poehler talks about this for like Emmys about yeah. like how it's like you have to pretend you don't want the cookie yeah. even though of course everybody yeah. wants I the like cookie. it when people just acknowledge I'm like yeah that would have been really meaningful to me but you know I'm gonna be a good sport and congratulations to the person who won it but like I it, I'm a little disappointed Yeah, Yeah. you can still be gracious and express disappointment, I feel like. It definitely feels like a very big green flag when someone can like talk about disappointment casually or like talk about like rejection or something like that they didn't go their way and admit that they wanted it to go their way without like being like, oh, I didn't care if it went my way ever. Like, I'm over it. Nally and I have some uh, wedding uh, (gasps) updates for y'all. So dying to know. Thought we we would share. We picked a wedding date. Spring of 2024. And we're going to get married in Georgia. <gasps> we're oh taking it back home, God. baby. <laughs> Natalie, was that like what you'd kind of always like envisioned for yourself on some level? Oh, absolutely. I like always dreamed of getting married at the place we're getting married at. And I thought that dream would be shattered because they, the city cut off like 11 acres of this property to build a highway. And they cut like some of my favorite part of the property. It was like a big willow tree. It was just like this stunning piece. And the city just took it. And so I was like, I guess I won't get married there. 
And then, you know, we've had a lot of conversations and we have a lot of help from people and we made it happen. So I'm really, really excited. Things are getting real. I honestly, like when we got engaged, I mean, like, and we even kind of mentioned it, like, I think the intent was to have a fairly expedited engagement. It all happens so fast. And then you start wedding, you know, like thinking about wedding planning. And then for us, it's like, we didn't really know when to start or where to start. It's like, we have all this to do. Where do we, where do we go to? And I think we got a little like overwhelmed. And so we kind of like took a, a, a small step back. Then we found Zola and that, that really, that, that helped change our kind of wedding planning course. Because before that, it was like, where, where do we, what are we supposed to do? How do you? Yeah, like, what's the order of? How do you start? I have like talked to so many of my friends who planned their wedding and they just always like scared me because they talked about how stressful it was. And that is the last thing I want. I want the planning to be just as fun as the actual wedding. And Zola has made it so easy. I love it. I mean, I was familiar with Zola. Like my cousin Cole just used them yeah. for their, their and weddings And so we up. got their wedding invite through their, they used Zola for their website and that's how we RSVP'd and their invites and things like that. We asked some friends and they highly recommended Zola. And so like we just started using them and it really just if you if anyone's out there wedding planning and you like you feel overwhelmed and you don't know where to go and like how to start like honestly like truly you got to check out Zola because they do it all like from beginning to end it's like you can do their custom website and then they have this great place that's where we did that's how we started doing our guest list and they make it really easy to make and adjust you know if you change your mind and things like that that's where you kind of start we started with our guest list yeah that was the first yeah, thing we did the first the first thing we did wedding planning uh, wise. You can do custom invitations, things like that. And then because we're getting married in Georgia, they have like, they work with like local, they have work with all different types of vendors, like, I guess really across the world. Yeah. You can yeah. just put in like your location of where your wedding is. And then it pulls up all local vendors for DJ, for food catering, for tents, yeah. for linens. We don't know any vendors in the place in which we're, we're getting married. So Zola kind of hooks it up and like gives you a list of different vendors from like, you know, florals and like, you know, like Natalie said, DJs. I, I'm just not good at doing that stuff. Like, I don't know, like, I don't know how to search for things. And the vendors who work with Zola, are, they're verified and like approved so they could kind of trusted partners of zola so they've been great to work with yeah it's uh, not just like some random person who's like thrown on their website they've been vetted and they've have a lot of experience in weddings which is like a sense of ease yeah because i just felt so overwhelmed starting and i you know i think sometimes we didn't know where to start and if you have been planning a wedding maybe you can relate to this but like you just feel overwhelmed so you set it aside for a couple of days you set it aside you set it aside but they just they really made it easier so it's been a, a breath of fresh air i'm so excited because i'm like designing the on their customizable invite designs to save the dates and like invitations and stuff. I'm so excited and pulling inspiration from all over and they look so good. And they will share a little something, something. We get asked about it all the time. And it's like, we, you know, and it's like we were planning, you know, we were planning to plan. Yeah. There was a lot of planning to plan. It's like well, We just needed a little help. Yeah. So now, now we got the ball rolling and ball. Uh, we will share more of our wedding planning experience with you. And uh, I got to say, if you're out there and you just got engaged or you've been engaged and the wedding plan is put off, I'm telling you, just check out Zola. It, especially if you feel lost and overwhelmed, they, they really make it super easy. Your registry, I mean, literally you, from beginning, from like cradle to grave, so to speak, when it comes to your wedding planning process. They, they have it all. Cradle to grave. You ever heard that expression? No, yeah. but I love it. Cradle to grave. Yeah. Yeah. Zola's got it, it got all it there from, from beginning to end. You can even, so you can make like a customizable website, obviously, that you send to the, your guest list and they can see like itinerary and travel and whatnot and RSVP and stuff there. And you can add like a little video to, so I want to add us a video on ours. Ooh, look out, look out for that. If you've heard me talk about weddings, uh, we talk about it a lot lately and I emphasize it's your day and don't ruin it with all the rigmarole. And that's such a priority for Nally and I. So, so far, so great when it comes to our wedding planning experience. It's giving stress-free. It's giving, it's giving stress-free. Yeah. Uh, anyway, guys, once again, thank you so much for being with us on this journey. Whether you've listened to one or all 600 episodes, we appreciate you all so much. Uh, what a great time to maybe give us a five-star review if you're feeling so generous. But truly, thank you. We have so much great episodes uh, ahead for you. Can't wait to give you 600 more. 
We love you. We thank you for all the things you've done for us and our show. Also, before uh, we get to Justin, next week is the premiere of The Bachelorette season. I don't know if you've had the pleasure of listening to Natalie, myself, and the gang, along with Elise Gilfoyle, going over The Bachelor bios. Maybe you've thought to yourself, I'm not watching this season, you know, for whatever reason. Perhaps that reason was you thought that Charity, as lovely as a human as she might be, might be too grounded, might be too mature. The family therapist that she is, she might be not dramatic television. Well, I'm here to say, after watching the first two episodes, that our girl Charity is a little messier than I anticipated in the best possible way. There is someone that she seems to really like that you're all going to fucking hate. And if history tells us anything, it is that great television on The Bachelor is when the lead likes someone that you are truly disgusted with. And uh, she seems to have a really bad picker early on. And if I've really, I've been pleasantly surprised by the entertainment value of the first two episodes. So that's all I'm going to say. Either way, we'll be recapping it. I highly recommend you checking it out if you are on the fence, because it is so far a, a, a season I have really enjoyed. We are taking a uh, two-week hiatus from Better Date Than Never because I will be traveling internationally and unavailable. So uh, we're going to take a couple weeks break and we will be back better than ever when we return to Better Date Than Never. So it will not be live tonight at 9 p.m. Eastern. Sadly, we we are going to take a couple weeks off. So enjoy your summer. Miss us because we'll miss you. And we will return to you in a couple weeks. And we can't wait to do that. Justin Long, everybody. Happy 600. Need a break from reality? Ever feel like you just want to escape? Well, cheer up, Buttercup, because Paramount Plus has your great reality escape. Escape into new seasons of the biggest competition shows ever. That's right, like Survivor, Big Brother, and the Challenge World Championship. With the boldest personalities from the family Stallone to RuPaul's Drag Race All-Stars and queen of the universe and the wildest drama like Are You the One? Plus hundreds of previous seasons all streaming at your fingertips. See, reality ain't so bad. Your great reality escape is with Paramount Plus. Paramount Plus, stream now. You know, they're developing technology. Uh, they have it where they can, they can tell what animals are thinking. They can communicate with animals. How? I don't know. I don't know. I wouldn't be here if I knew. I develop, I'd be. But it's coming out? Because I always want to know what Jeff's thinking. I think thinking. it's, they have the technology. I think they're trying to make it accessible. They can do certain words. <laughs> like there's. They can communicate. They, they can understand what they're saying. They can translate. Um, I think dogs and I don't know. I thought all animals were just like, when I hear animals out in the wild, I, I, th I just think of them. Like I was in the rainforest. Kate and I, we could talk about that. We were in the rainforest. And there was just sound. I mean, you know, you put on one of those rainforest apps, but it's just noises, like a cacophony of sounds. And, and I just imagine them all to be like, I want to fuck. Or like, I'm, it's, it's pretty much that, right? Like I, call signs. Call, yeah, who wants yeah. to fuck? I want to fuck. You want to fuck? I'm horny. I'm horny. I want babies. <laughs> but all, all over the place. But I guess I don't know. Maybe they're saying other things. When do we have we begun? Kind of. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah we of, never really know. It's just you do like a soft. That's launch. what I like. A soft. Yeah. yeah. It's a cold open. Sometimes. There's some direct. Like Clint Eastwood doesn't say action for that reason. He just, you know, and some directors do that whenever. Yeah. Whenever I, the guy who directed, he's just on that interview was Ken, Ken Quapis. And he, he kind of sounded like this. He was a very sweet, he is a very sweet, gentle guy. And he would just go, yeah, go whenever you're ready, you know? So you don't feel this now I'm not acting and now I am acting. So it's just, it, it, it helps for a more organic as you. Yeah. Yeah. I guess so. I, I like it when we just kind of start organically yeah. and, and pick up. And then sometimes I'll just say like, Hey, Justin, welcome. You know? Yeah. Like. There's no, it's interesting. There's no like, there's no shift. Sometimes when, I mean, you've done these and I'm sure being on The Bachelor, it's you felt when the cameras came out, there was probably some kind of palpable like sure. energy shift. And like, yeah. even if it's just a little like, oh, now we're on. Oh yeah. You'd yeah. almost see it. You see it. I would notice it more with my peers. I bet. And not so much that I wasn't doing it, but yeah. I could see them. I could see the shift in the energy turning and like it on. everyone turning it on, yeah. you know, it, cause like the downtime of like us just like being human beings and talking about life and then all of a sudden be a cocktail party and be like, why are you acting so weird? Yeah, I you bet. Know, like, I, thought, well, I thought we were friends yeah, 10 minutes ago. I, like what the fuck, I Jeff? You know, Is like, there any way that that's funny? I know I see that on the show. Cause 
then they have like especially bachelor in paradise they have have the cameras that people probably maybe even forget about because they're not as visible and so they're behaving a little bit more whether it's more affectionate <laughs> or like you know they get a little more touchy yeah in those cameras and, and then i also notice it when they do the outtakes when they're oh my god a bug or something goes wrong a, a stand falls and you get to i i always wish they would include those things in the show as part of or on the dates you know if something goes wrong that's often when the best stuff happens the that's, human, yeah yeah the humanity comes yeah. out now we were talking about this on life is short my podcast about what what a good first date food would be you know what's a good thing to eat on a first date and somebody had written in about i love soup dumplings these um they're called jialong baos i just i took my i took kate there yesterday for her first din tai fung but you it's, did yeah it's a, you, the, have you had them the soup dumplings yeah, yeah. Uh, nick kind of sounded a little sad like yeah. you took you her, took her and not me. Me. Yeah. <laughs> it was very tender well, are yeah. we gonna go for what a, sure? I, yeah or are we, <laughs> can we go he's like Again. are we surprise <laughs> made <laughs> <laughs> but I have to leave for you know a week. You're going three, two weeks. Three yeah, weeks. yeah. I I'm so I wish we could talk about it because I'm so in, I'm so curious. Yeah, you I'm I'm nervous. I bet you can't you can't say. I don't think I'm supposed to, no, to okay. talk about it okay. yet. Yeah, um, but I am doing a show that that requires quite a bit of courage, resiliency. Yeah, I, you don't think courage? Probably. Yeah. yeah. I don't think I'm going to die though. Yeah. But but there's a there's a this is my thing about. And, and I, I get into this with Kate all the time because she's jumped out of a plane and you've jumped out of a plane. You haven't. I have not. You should. Tell me why. Because I, I can tell you why I don't want to. Let's start there. It's, it, you know, when people die, you know, you read about a death, like there's a part of me that thinks, well, they put themselves in a very dangerous situation. You know, you jump out of a plane and it's the, the likelihood of dying is, is greatly increases compared to if you weren't to jump out of the plane. Yeah, no, I mean, that's a very, like, sound argument. It's like, if you read about a death, like, let's say I die doing it, and you read it, people read about it, um, and they'll, they'll, they'll say, which is arrogant of me to think that they'll read about it, but they probably will, and it'll be like, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people, myself included, might think, well, I mean, yeah, but it's like the Darwin Awards. You ever read the Darwin Awards? No. Yeah. <laughs> what is that? It's, oh, my God. Yeah. What, how would you describe people who, I mean, it's... Yeah, it's sort of, it's like, kind of like a cheeky way of, Oh, oh, without now sounding like callous, it, it sounds words. callous because it's like it's about it's people who die doing things that were probably were ill advised. They should have known the, yeah. the name being like a reference to the fact that you know, like survival of the fittest. Like this was maybe a, a not super fit decision to engage in yeah. this kind of thing. So listen, I I think anything could be made into a dangerous thing. So like the jumping out of a plane, mm -hmm. like you know, skydiving. Right? I get what you're saying. But like the act of skydiving is relatively, well, it is actually not even relatively. It's extremely safe if, if, you're, if your focus is just to survive the skydive. If all you're doing is, I want to jump out of this plane, pull the chute, uh -huh. it's actually extremely safe. And I was actually talking about this with Natalie. We went, to, we went and got dinner uh, at a place called Burger Shoot. Have you been to Burger Shoot Road? Burger she wrote. No, I've heard about Tom it. Beverly, very good. I I've heard I, it's you like great. a good smash burger. It's excellent. Uh, and I love a good pun. Yeah. And so it's you, got both those yeah, things. Yeah, there you go. And then right next to it is uh, an um, amazing Mexican joint owned by the same people. So you can actually like order from both. Sometimes we do that. Uh, okay. Really, really, really good. It's on Beverly? It's on Beverly. What's the Mexican place called? Because that sounds familiar. There's like so many Mexican places okay. on, that, on that street. Yes. Okay. Uh, it's kind of, I think called Consuela. Okay. Something like that. Shout out. It's a good yeah. shout out. But like now down the... Down the path from El Coyote, mm -hmm. and uh, I loved El Coyote. And then there's a lot of fun a, at El Coyote. There's another place, but anyway, it's right. You 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 sit outside. You have your smash burger, and you're like right. You know, it's like L.A. So you're like you have a table, and you're next to cars, and you're yeah. like around the street. And I'm just like look, and it's it was relatively busy traffic, and you're just looking at all the people driving, and there's just you just just an insane number of cars, and yeah. all these people on their phones and I distracting, know. and I you're know. like every day I get into a car. And You're I right. put my life on the line exactly with Kate all these people yeah. that I have no idea what they're doing or what they're thinking about. And You're how at the mercy of I'm all at the of mercy them. of all these yeah. people. And like, and when you really think about it, that sounds insane. I and know. then simply jumping out of a plane. <laughs> it's a good argument. It's actually relatively, uh, t relatively safe. All the uh -huh. accidents, well, not all, but I, it seems like the almost overwhelming majority of people who have ever had an accident jumping out of a plane, uh -huh. it's the professionals. Huh. And it's because they are pushing the limits. So they are oh. jumping with smaller parachutes or they're pulling the cord 
huh. you know, far later, you know, when, when they're say only like 500 feet above ground or going at a certain speed and they're doing tricks and, and that's where it goes wrong. But like huh. laymen who are just like, Hey, giant parachute where like, you know, you just jump and pull actually incredibly safe. I, I appreciate that argument. Yeah. And I'm also, um, I also wish I hadn't heard it because now I think part subconsciously I'm, I'm looking for excuses too. My biggest fear jumping out of plane yeah. was the fear of falling. Uh -huh. That, that, that roller coaster bungee jump kind of free fall where your stomach stays oh, and yes. you fall. Fear not doesn't exist in skydiving. Really? Yeah. That like uh, my stomach's going into my esophagus doesn't exist. Really, I wonder why. Sir Isaac Newton once say, "When something is in motion, it continues to stay in motion." You've heard that yeah. type of thing. So when you're when you're skydiving, you get in a plane, which is why when you drop something from a building, no matter the the weight, it's it falls in the same the same maybe. velocity. Yeah, I but this, I don't know if that's the part I'm talking about. <laughs> but I'm talking <laughs> yeah, about the ta I'm talking about the part that when you get in a plane, you're yeah. already going. 150 or two i don't know what the speed uh -huh. the plane is going at but your body is already in motion so when you oh. jump out you're just simply changing direction you're not oh, starting at zero right. and it's the feeling of your body not moving and then going at an incredible speed instantaneously that gives you that feeling of falling that's the roller coaster Be effect yeah because oh, you you start right. you're starting at zero miles per hour and then you immediately drop so like a bungee jump would feel that way would, would feel that way oh. but skydiving is just simply you just feel like you're flying wow oh that's a really great so argument. there is no feeling of falling okay well now if i do die in a skydiving accident all my fault <laughs> well there's not all but you've contributed greatly to i'll it. feel pretty bad <laughs> yeah i'll definitely feel bad the thing that reassures me the most when i went skydiving is yeah. i was like if i die this place is out of business forever that's, forever that, like there's money on the line for them they need so, me like, in this capitalist yeah. that, world oh you're right i see what you're saying i thought it was like um some kind of schadenfreude like if if that they would if because they oh, yeah, killed like you my revenge yeah your revenge from the afterlife <laughs> from the grave that's a good point that's a, another really good point we, we were gonna go skydiving huh. for my friend's 40th a couple weeks ago but weather didn't work out should you us. guys go skydiving and then go get dumplings that's not a that would be bad awesome. idea i wouldn't mind going skydiving I, I think you'd be a good person to go skydiving with because Why? you sound well, because you're making a good argument for it, but also you, I bet you'd be very relaxed. And I was I, very nervous. I mean, I haven't done it in 20 years. Oh. I did it for my college graduation. Oh. You've uh, done it once then? Only done it once. And at what point in the dive did you think, this is great. This is not what I thought it was going to be. This is not scary. Um, when you landed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because, because it was tandem, right? And so you're, oh, you're yeah. strapped to like someone who knows what they're doing and it's. And so when you're on, what the are they doing? Are they yelling things? Like, are, they're all can you they're hear? the creepiest people. Oh, really? Oh, okay, <laughs> yeah. now this is a con. Put like, this in the con. The aisle. con is they're kind of they're, they're kind like of the carnies of the sky. Yeah, they're, oh. yeah, they're kind of grimy, and then like they. And granted, this is 20 okay. years ago, so maybe 20, 23, they're a little bit more appropriate. But they're being super inappropriate with all the women and. <laughs> Oh, so, yeah. like, this is a, my God. experience. But like you're strapped in. So yeah, like, once you're strapped in, it's very doesn't intimate. matter. You're, 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 you're fucked. You're like, I'm actually, I have no choice but to roll out of this plane. And that is a very surreal feeling. Like I'm actually going to just, so I'm, with, I'm just going to jump. With a creepy stranger. I might with die a, with a creepy stranger yeah. strapped to me. <laughs> and, and so like at the time when I was skydiving, when I was about to, to roll out, I could feel, so you have like a strap over your shoulder, like uh -huh. a, it feels like a backpack. And I could feel it kind of. It felt like it was like gliding Did, off my shoulder. Oh no. My so that was really paranoid about that. Oh, but I, I oh forgot about the fact that you have like 30 hooks. You're hooked in. That, that had nothing to do. Yeah. But I was, so but while, still, while I was the, falling, I was like, oh like pulling on the shoulder God, thinking, I, and I was just imagining the chute opening and then me like just slipping, slipping out. out. <laughs> oh man. And you did such great work to convince me to do it. And now you're, you're undoing, but it was totally <laughs> safe. That was just me being paranoid. I was fully yeah. secure. And, and then in fact, for me, falling was not the most fun part hmm. because you, it, it honestly just feels like you are standing up in a convertible. Oh, it's just like, sh <laughs> yeah. The wind, you wow. know, and there's no sense of falling, but when the chute opens, wow. you're still like, well, you, so we jumped at 15,000 feet, uh -huh. fell for about 50 seconds to a minute. So you fall for about 10,000 feet. Wow. wow. And the chute opens at 5,000 feet. So you're still 5,000 feet in the sky and wow. you're just like Peter panning it. You're just standing in the sky. And if you don't, you know, you look up, you see the chute, but like your sense of like, holy shit, I'm floating 
Like in it's yeah. it, that was to me the coolest part. Oh, just bet. kind of like, oh, that would be, like you're that would like be cool. You know, I wish I could just get there without going up in the plane. The anticipation, the strapping in, the creepy instructor. I wish I could just be. <laughs> in the air you know but once you floating. do it you're landing you're like that was the cool like i yeah, remember yeah. waking mm -hmm. up and it was a little cloudy and i remember like not, i was t like i even lying to myself being like yeah i want to go but like i hope it like rains like i, I wanted oh, it to get canceled yeah, yeah. i was definitely afraid of you had of real going. um butterflies you had real, oh I mean, yeah you, but yeah. i was very glad i did it it's um i'm i, I think i'll do it one day yeah i think i will i had the cream the creepy instructors is funny. Did, so, so the fifty seconds to a minute as you're falling, are you thinking about the parachute? Maybe not opening that, that. I definitely thought about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I was like, huh? It, what if it doesn't open? Are you going? Are you woo? Are you yelling? Are you like ah? Are you saying anything? Or are you just so in awe of? I was kind of in awe. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Were you a kid who went on roller coasters when when you were young? Uh, eventually, but I was also was a younger kid that chickened out. Oh, me, oh yeah. Me I definitely my mother was out. very neurotic about that. First stuff. time I went to Great America, I went on no roller coasters and I went with my uncle and he was very disappointed in me. Oh, oh, so he, <laughs> so he was encouraging you. How old were you? I wonder. Eight or nine. I've been listening to a lot of like Glennon Doyle and thinking a lot about I like internal family systems, you know, I, IFS stuff. And, and I'm, and I'm just so curious how people have become the way they are. Like where, where those fears came from. Like, like Kate uh, has a fear of spiders. We went on, she took me on this great birthday trip. We went to the rainforest uh, in Ecuador, which, is, which was like a childhood dream to go to the Galapagos, speaking of Darwin. So I got to the, go to the Galapagos Islands. And then she took me to this rainforest called the Chokey Rainforest. And, um, and she would go, she was so into all the animals. You know, she's, she's adventuresome. She jumped out of a plane. She's... Um, but spiders are a thing. And I asked her why that was. I, I wonder where that came from. And, um, and she, she pinpointed it. She knew exactly. When she was a kid, she loved spiders and she loved Charlotte's Web. You know, so she, and because of that book, the, 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 lead, the benevolent main character is a spider. And um, so she loved him. She would play with him and she would touch him. And she grew up in Cal, she lived in California when she was a kid. And she was going to reach for a spider, a black, you know, shiny orbed spider uh, with a little red marking underneath and she went to go touch it and her mother witnessed this and she patty shout out to <laughs> patty bosworth and she screamed and she was you know rightly so because she was about to touch a black widow Kate was about to touch a black and she didn't know it she didn't know that some and patty said oh, oh and screamed and stopped her and it was the the fear of that seeing I, I i do vaguely remember this like when my parents were that afraid you know you, you really absorb that kind of energy and so it was ever since then she's been really traumatized of it was a traumatic thing yeah but her mother was see i think about this and i don't know what i would do. like what do you do i was just talking about uh what do you do with kids because we you know we really want to have kids and and um I, i'm so curious how kids are formed and how you best form kids how do you keep kids um like if a kid is like curious about sex or something i was like a very like i, I was really <laughs> curious about sex when i was little when i was like how a, young oh man Four, five. I I've four. I've thought about. I actually was thinking about this last night because last night Natalie and I watched Twins mm. for the first time. <laughs> oh, and I hadn't seen Twins. I haven't seen it in a long time. In a long time. And then I re it was like it hit me. Uh, Marnie, Arnold's love interest, in Kelly the movie. Preston. Is that her? Who she was? I yeah, I was like beautiful. I said to Natalie, I'm like. Oh my God, I'm just having like this flashback. I would had such a crush Me on her. Me too. And I, that line, remember that line? Oh, this bed is lumpy. Yeah. She, <laughs> yes. uh, my brother and I always repeated that line. She, she, cause she tries to get, and I didn't understand what it meant. I was like, lumpy bed. Why is she so, cause she was just trying to like sleep, sleep with. She but was, I was like seven or eight when yeah, that movie too. came out. So yeah. I remember I having older. a crush on this woman before I hit puberty. And that, and like that weird, like before you hit puberty, knowing that you still <laughs> liked women. I, I, it's this strange, a weird, I had, I had this weird kind of feeling about it when I watched I, it last I, night. I'm so interested in that period because I've seen it in my nephews now, they're, they're five and three and, and there's this, when, when they're around Kate, they like, or any, I see them kind of like respond differently to, to, to women and to, and one of them, the three-year-old has like a crush on a girl now, but I remember being, watching Return of the Jedi. I was, that came out in 1980. I was like four when I saw it, five maybe, and seeing Carrie Fisher in that. You know, a bikini, bikini. Yeah. Leah Thompson in Back to the Future. I hate saying that one because I now know Leah. Yeah. I've become, I've like become friendly with her, and 
she was one of my first like you know, crushes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's a weird thing. But you're right. It's before it's sexualized. It's just like I gravitate toward that person. I, I uh, one of my brothers, I won't name, um, and I have a lot, so it's safer. But you do. Uh, that's right. I uh, we. <laughs> I, I, he was like probably like three or four. Will he five. know? Will he know? I don't. Yeah, if yeah. he listens, I don't yeah. think he's gonna listen. But really? I don't. Who knows? Maybe he does. Um, but uh, <laughs> we'd like walk into his bedroom, and he'd be like humping the floor. Oh yeah. And I'm not judging him. But I do think, yeah, I think like young boys or kids. I think when we when we get older, we think, oh, I didn't do shit like that until I hit puberty, and I think we forget kind of how weird we fucking were as little kids and how we how exploratory we were right. with our bodies and, but and then certain the, things before you even knew what it was but then the thing i'm so the thing i'm curious about now is how do we as as parents as potential parents what do you do in in, in the face of that like, how do you respond to that without adding sh without like injecting shame, shame yeah. or fear or you know uh like a friend of mine said he had a moment with his son in the in the bathtub they're they taking a bath together i used to take baths with my dad and and, um, and he, I, I, I think he was at one years old, maybe like, maybe around one, maybe one and a half. He just grabbed my friend's, can we say, what, 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 penis, dick, penis? Yeah. grabbed my friend's penis and, uh, just held it and he just stared at him and my friend, <laughs> and there's no, like, <laughs> there's no playbook for that. There's no, like, uh, I don't think a parent, parent book that's like, if your child grabs your penis and stares at you, <laughs> here's what you do. In the bathtub. In the bathtub or anywhere. <laughs> Because you want to laugh. I mean, my older brother is, is, he tells me stories about raising the kids, and like, he's like, they do things to push your boundaries that are so funny sometimes. You know, they're trying to get a rise out of you. They're trying to provoke, but it ends up just being funny. You want to laugh, but you can't, you know? So in this case, I said to my friend, well, what? You know, and he said, I didn't know what to do. I just, I kind of froze, and I said, that's, <laughs> he said, like, that's daddy's penis, <laughs> and that's, that's daddy's, and you have one, you know, just, but how do you... How do you impress upon a kid that that's like not something you should be doing in public? You know, if you without were, shaming them, without shaming yeah. them. I mean, just two guys without kids, yeah, mansplaining, child splaining. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm just I, curious. The things I think about because I, yeah. uh, like you. I mean, Nally and I are very much in the let's have kids yes. stage of our lives. Yeah, is this a first for you to be thinking this way? Have you always wanted kids? I've always wanted kids. Yeah, me too. So it's always been it's it's. It's my dream, yeah. dream come true. Oh, yeah. I've, uh, oh, you'll be a great dad. I hope so. Yeah. Yeah. Do you see, do you see m mistakes your parents made? Do you see, see things that were, I mean, are you able to discern uh, I, I have what you want to do? I, I, I feel like my parents did an amazing job, generally yeah. speaking. Um, I think around that topic, I, you know, I grew up very Catholic. Very, uh, me too? Very conservative. Ah, me too. Um didn't really talk a lot about sex. My, Same. you know, I, I definitely remember the birds and the bees conversation with my dad. You do. How did he, did he approach it? Was he awkward about it? I don't remember him being awkward. Uh -huh. I remember. Yeah, not really. But I also don't remember ever feeling when I was old enough to know what it really was. I yeah. remember having the conversation so young that I was like bored of the conversation. I mean, like, why are you, why are we talking about oh, this? Like, uh, I don't. You've already, you already knew. Yeah. Like, I, well, I think my <laughs> Brian down the street, kid down the street told uh -huh. me about it. My parents were living. So then like, it was like a forced conversation. My dad like, <laughs> Brian needed to have, the gun. but I also remember like, you know, not being old enough to have an interest yeah. in the yeah. topic. It was like, huh? Okay. Well, I, cool. I Can I go play with my, you know, <laughs> toys? I remember being in fifth grade. I, I was a late bloomer in every respect, you know, like, um, gro growth wise, <laughs> intellectually. Um, and definitely when it came to sex, cause they just didn't, we didn't talk about it in my family. It wasn't. Um, yeah, but I never felt comfortable. You know, once I hit puberty, I would. Oh my god, would never talk about it with my parents. Yeah, you know, I, like, and so funny. I think that's one thing I very much. You know, if I were to change anything from how I was raised to how I hope to raise my children, yes, is I, I want them to feel very comfortable talking about that stuff. Me too. With. with me and mom, so to speak. That's why I've been thinking about it. I feel like, what do I know about parenting? But I just want, I want to empower my kids to um, like respect themselves and respect boundaries so that yes. they don't feel the need to like, you know, rebel against, you know, us or the world and, and teach it. Like, I just want my kid to feel like they have value. Uh -huh. And so whatever they do, they will, they'll ask themselves, is this worth 
my time. Is this worth, like, you know, rather than tell them they can't do something or right. shame them into not doing something, I want right. them to think about whether they, they think it's worthy of themselves. Well, this, this Glennon Doyle podcast, which I'm going to poorly regurgitate now, uh, is they talked about the idea that you're not to compartmentalize uh, things like shame and, and behavior that is not um, healthy. So in a relationship, like with Kate, let's say, like I, I would say if I did, so, if I behaved in a way that I, um, I wasn't proud of, wasn't like the, you know, healthy behavior, it, we'd say like, well, this wasn't good. This thing wasn't good. This behavior wasn't, let's talk about it, like where it came from. Instead of saying you're not good, you, you know, you're, you're yeah. uh, deficient in some way, which, which causes, def which creates like a defensiveness and yeah. then you the, go the to defense, protect yourself yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. And, 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 it, and it just spirals out of control. So it's like, this thing, I don't know, there's a, there's a way to communicate that to kids. And my sister-in-law, I think, does that really well. I've been really like, aware of how she's parenting because she's, she's got two boys and, and um, she's very communicative with them. She's very, uh, let's talk about why you did that, you know, where it came from, where behavior comes from. And I, so I still think, I mean, as do you. I mean, it's, you talk to adults about it and it's, it's like, how are you formed that way? And and so if you can nip it in the bud, if you can... totally, yeah. Well, because yeah, we nowadays we're learning so much about like how our uh, our behaviors as adults is just is a product from things that have happened from our childhood. Mm -hmm. I think that's the single most thing I've learned in therapy is totally. Anytime we are essentially triggered, you know, and triggers could be a variety, like could be a significant trigger or, or just like a like a trigger, small trigger, but Ultimately, when we are triggered, we, we just basically turn into our, the age in which we yes. first experienced that trigger. I am yeah. fascinated by it. And that's really it's, fascinating. It led to relationships I was in, because I, I, I dealt with a lot of that without knowing, without knowing, having those tools and having the, I had the curiosity, I guess, but I wasn't well versed enough in, in, that, in the world of therapy and where these things, and exploring where these things come from. And now I just find it, um, and now I'm with the healthiest person I've ever been with, so I I, I, it's, it's very safe. It's a safe place. So I don't have to, I can explore those things in a, in a safe way without like there being like this urgency to, to save a relationship. And I got to figure out why we're behaving, why is this person behaving this way? Does that, I don't know if that yeah. makes sense. Oh. But, but there's one that I've been thinking about a lot, which is, which um, you just touched on, which is the, you, it's called the adaptive child self. There's, there's a school of thought that says we, we all want to live, we, we want to get to the wise self where everyone wants that's the the goal that's is to be wise and wise selves but so many of us live most of our behavior comes from an it's called an adaptive child self which is when we're kids we we and and we respond to dysfunction in our lives uh to protect ourselves and, and it's actually a good thing so if you have an alcoholic parent um maybe you'll you'll to, to protect yourself you'll say well oh they're not t too drunk they, they just like to have a, a couple drinks and they're just having fun they're letting off steam you know um and it's a way to protect yourself so those remain those adaptive child self in, in, impulses remain um and that's something i've been really watching in my own life where certain things come from where do triggers come from why do they exist so i can change it you know so i can be better I, and i this may be disgusting we might have to cut this out but i i just had a moment of a little pride <laughs> because on on my way here i ate um this might be disgusting. I ate a lot of papaya. I've been trying to, you know, get Cleanse my, the body. Yeah, get my system going. And I, for your listeners who don't know, this is a public service announcement. Papaya it has these enzymes that really help you. It's a natural laxative. Yes, yeah. it, okay. it helps you move. And um, <laughs> helps you move. And, and, and I was <laughs> Allie. <laughs> like, I yeah. might need some papaya. Uh, uh, really? Allie is very uh, open about her plumbing issues. Oh, yeah. I, I, I mean, like at one point in my life, it was like once every seven to ten days. Like what? I'm just like. I'm sorry. Yeah. To sh that's yeah. shameful. I'm <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I have some shame Damn. about that. I'm oh so <laughs> sorry. Like, I have such shame around that. That that was insensitive. Seven to ten days. Yeah, it's better now. Good. Ish. Do, does papaya help? Does it work? I don't for think you? I've ever eaten papaya. Well, oh, okay. I have some in the car. I, um, <laughs> I couldn't finish it all. I, try try it out. I'm curious. Okay. Um, because I I. Struggles. It's been my whole life. So if you really? just solve my whole life, like wow. Uh, in in potty training, were you like a late potty trainer, like age? Because no, I had like, a I had a sibling hmm. who was like afraid of pooping. Was it the same one that was humping the floor? Yes, actually. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I, intuitively, and I think I know which one it is. 
<laughs> no, but my sister and I were both like impacted as babies. Like it oh. was like a it we came out that way. Wow. We were both like lactose intolerant. Neither of us was like breastfed. So it's like we've had oh. a lot of like digestive. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Huh. Mm-hmm. I think mine was more psychological. Like my no. my mom's mom my I my mom was an actress and um and we couldn't always like afford the nanny or so. So we would have to like run around the city with her and which is the, probably the reason that the idea of being an actor when I was young was like uh, abhorrent. Like it's like the last thing I wanted to do because the image I had of like a professional actor was so stressful the and chaos, chaos and filled with rejection and like taxi cabs, not, you know, I just, it was just chaos. And, um, but I remember her taking us to Grand Central and if we'd had to go number two, if we had to poo, she would hold us she would like layer the seat or something and her mom would hold her above the seat in a, in a public so there was this i think it started as like a germ thing whatever it was it was like that is bad public defecation <laughs> is in a toilet <laughs> it's bad. not my favorite thing to do i will really i'll yeah I'll... i had a toilet explode on me in disney world as a child do you think it stems to that <laughs> oh yeah. When you say explode I'm not a professional. on you, you mean like yeah. came back out? Oh no! Like ja- like and a it was like right touched your body. Like oh, I, it was right before the parade, and my mom like no. walked me out. I was like sopping wet, and she was like, "By the way, your toilet is broken because we had to get to the parade." And then we had to stay there, and they gave me a bunch of coupons, and then like they bought me a bunch coupons. of coupons, like, Disney clothes to <laughs> Thank wear because I was all wet. So so it, it came. Like the uh, everything, I, I would like never poop hurricane. again. Like a geyser. <laughs> yeah. Would... Oh my god. Oh my god. I, I did well, you have like toilet they... monster dreams? You know how like those. I don't think it like super affected like... me. Well, yeah. Well, well, yours sounds more physiological. Like you, so you don't have just in terms of like let's say you were to go to a um a doctor's appointment and and there's one uh, bath there's a single stall bathroom. Would you go no uh, with the lock? Would you go number two in there? Oh, I'd go number two anywhere. Anywhere. That's same with, yeah, same with Kate. Probably go like behind a bush. <laughs> oh, yeah. really? Yeah. Wow. I env- envy you. I mean, <laughs> I, I really admire that because I have, I guess, shame from it. So I, I guess what I what precipitated this was I I'm, was proud of myself because you have a single uh, single bathroom here. I yeah. mean, meaning like there's just one toilet in the, in on the, the floor. room. On the floor. Yeah. It's a community bathroom. And I, and I use, <laughs> and normally, I think this is one of the first times I've, I've, use that I, I i will avoid that situation because i because of shame i guess but i i had to use it because i know i also knew we'd be talking and if and if i didn't get it out i'd be thinking well, about it and, and talking moment. about it which is yeah. which we are anyway so. i'm glad we could help you get over that hurdle i am too i'm i'm i appreciate it um but i it, i don't know where i'm wondering where it comes from i i do remember um yeah, well, yours is pretty clear. I mean, if, if I had a toilet explode, I would be, <laughs> I, I, I would know that that was it. But I think I, 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 I know I, um, I was afraid of using the toilet in, in school and in kindergarten. I, uh, we, I thought it was a half day. So I thought my parents were going to come pick me up and I ended up, we were at recess and I, and I learned at recess that it, it wasn't a half day. And so I had calculated my, you know, when you, you know, your brain, your brain doesn't connect to your bowels. It's like, your brain gives you just enough time to, to clench. Because, like, I, I think the sphincter is a really incredible... Mu- the sphincter, I remember I, somebody said, it doesn't get enough credit as a, <laughs> as a part of your body for, like, keeping things at bay. You know, just like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> just, just take it, like, you stay. And it's just this one muscle that's doing it, that's keeping us from, like... Completely complete embarrassing embarrassment so, yeah. all the time. At any given moment. And so it's holding it together. And at that point, my sphincter, as, as much work as it had done, it was like, sorry. I, I, I gave you an I gave you a half hour of clenching and that's all I have and so I just l- let it go and I it's one of my earliest childhood memories I was probably five and I could I can remember the f- sensation of it seeping down my legs I had overalls on I had Oshkosh <laughs> and um, <laughs> and the next period was uh, story time and so I thought well fuck I gotta just ride this out I gotta I, there's nothing I I have it it's coming going to my Spider Man shoes I but you know. Hopefully it won't get on the floor, and I can just, I can just ride it out. And you're and, too afraid to tell anyone. Uh, yes, too much shame. So no one noticed. No one so, smelled it. And so it was warmer in September, and um, it was a warm day. I should have just said that. And the, and so story time. I made it through story time. Then it was nap uh, nap time. So we all went on our cots, and I remember, oh, no. I remember thinking I was staring at the the clock, the the clock on the wall. I was just staring, hoping, just willing it to go to three o'clock, and and thinking oh, I think I got away with 
with this. You know, no one noticed, no one, none of the kids noticed. And, and the teacher, she was so sweet, Mrs. Humphrey, she, she came over to me, she got, got all the way up from her desk and walked over to me. And she said, honey, um, do you need to use, do you need to go to the nurse? And she, that's what she said. Do you need to see the nurse? And I said, and I pretended to sleep. I remember pretending to sleep. I remember being like, well, well probably really poorly. You know, really like, what yeah. was it? Your first yeah. Just in the thespian. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I was like, what? Um, and I was like, uh, no, why would I? Why? No, I'm okay. Why would I need, need that? You know? And she was like, oh, okay. And she went back to her desk. And I thought, I, I, got, I dodged that bullet. Um, she's, she's none the wiser. I played it off perfectly. And then she, a couple minutes went by. It must have. And she got back up. She went back over to me and she said, honey, and a little bit more sternly, you know, like a little bit more forcefully, I really think you should go to the nurse. And I just burst into tears, you know, because she, the jig was up. And, and so I went and my dad had, to, it was a whole thing. My dad had to come with a plastic bag and put my <laughs> shameful, like soiled Put clothes. you in the bag. Yes, yeah. yes, exactly. <laughs> a hazmat suit. Um, Is that a kid in there? Lice, yeah, de louse me. Yeah. Like a prison, hose you like off. First day yeah. in prison, but but I think it was. I think that must have. That's might have been hugely traumatic. I think it was. I, mean, I know. <laughs> I'm talking about yeah. it. Forty years later. <laughs> <laughs> I used to pee my pants a lot. You know, like I have a very vivid memory of peeing. I I mm. would get excited and laugh, and I'd pee. Oh, that's and a nice. I, way I to... remember <laughs> like I, I have a vivid memory of like that's a nice. I remember being at the roller skating rink and peeing my pants. But 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 completely just you? a little pee or just fully like letting go. I mean, it was enough to make so, the pants sweat. Yeah. Five or six. Oh, so you were well, rollerblading, remember... but you couldn't hold your pee. He was excited. He was laughing. All right. Now I you're think judging. It would be harder I, to I hold to, your pee. And while I, I remember. I have this vivid memory of like hiding behind the the. Oh, the rabbit cage there we had a, like a little rabbit outdoor rabbit oh. cage and i in your house a hutch outdoor yeah. and 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 i peed my pants and my sister like would tell on me and i would be hiding behind the rabbit cage oh yeah. and then i was a bit of a bed uh, yeah more of a not a day not even a bed wetter i was a daytime uh, pants peer yeah a, a, a day wetter i would just get really <laughs> i would get really excited and, and you'd wet anytime i think it was because i'd be like i'd be too i wouldn't go in and go to the bathroom mm -hmm. i would just be having too much fun and what? i'd hold it and then someone would like, it's like make little me kids laugh. at pools you're like no you yeah. have to go yes like, and then i would like, and, like the you can always like as someone who like watches a lot of kids you could always tell like oh, i know they're, they're like little bouncy, fidgeting yeah. they're yeah. Little, like, that they was me and i'm yeah. like please like yeah. i will pause <laughs> yes, the game yes. like well, go pee my nephew my nephew it's, it makes me smile so so big because he doesn't like i can tell he has to go and his parents will say like do, do you do you want to go and, and like no, no and he avoids it i think because he's having fun mm -hmm. playing and he just i, I don't quite re remember Such an that. inconvenience it's you have an to go pee yeah, at yeah. The time. Uh, yeah. okay <laughs> pull my pants down dude i also love that they have the kids have no shame you know i rem i kind of remember that i was talking to my brother my, I, I do the podcast with my brother and we, we um we've been doing two now so we do one on friday called life is shorter and it's just the two of us talking it's so fun we're just I don't know if it's fun for other people, but it's fun for us. We're just hanging out and we were talking about um, how we used to play. Did you do this with your brothers? Like play swords? Yeah. Yeah. You pee together. You pee well, I didn't do, well, I did it with more, I guess my friends because my oh. brothers were too younger, too much younger than me. So like in first and second grade, I remember doing that with friends at school. Yeah. And there was, yeah. but there was no like, how far could you back <clears throat> up from the stall? Yeah, sure. You yeah. got to get a nice arc. Yeah. You have to get, <laughs> we would play that game. <laughs> well, sometimes when I was a younger man, uh, you'd wake up with a in a certain state uh in terms of at attention yes yeah. at attention and and um and you'd have to <laughs> you'd have to do that again you'd have to like i remember thinking i wish i'd studied more in, in geometry i wish i knew more about like um you know in art like an arc and how to really measure the distance <laughs> yeah, like sine cosine, cosine yes <laughs> all this sort of, i can't even talk about it appropriately because i don't know the terminology but there was no shame you know we'd be peeing and christian said i don't remember ever really looking at your P penis like w w we were talking about this because in ecuador we i went to ecuador i noticed that there weren't stalls on the urinals it was just um they were all just kind of open was and like a sink uh it wasn't a tr those i struggle with the troughs yeah like a, <laughs> at, like, a, at, like a wrigley field i think they have yeah, like, yeah. troughs yeah um that's rough there's one in yeah city field Mets. you're you're a cubs fan I'm a Brewer fan, actually. Bre oh, that's right. That yeah. makes sense. But but there was no and and I, I he, Christian said, "Why? Well, maybe they just trust people to not be creepy and like look and you know to to get." But but I said, "There's no." And he said, "Well, I said, well, why would you not want to? I mean, like, 
what is the harm in just noticing? I mean, by accident, not stare. I said, there's, if you don't ogle it, if you just stare at a penis. And he said, ah, penises are, <laughs> you know, funny take on it. He said, I don't know if I just want to, they're just strange. I don't know. They're just like pink and kind of like sad looking and strange, like a baby marsupial kind of. Um, I had this friend in college that would, <laughs> if he would it's not come, appealing. come into a public bathroom, Yeah, it was busy. And if he were peeing next to each other, he would like make a scene. He would like deliberately look over and pretend he didn't know me and like say very loudly. And he's like, that's a really beautiful cock. And <laughs> just to try to get a reaction out of everyone around him. It was kind of funny. We would. In, in what grade? Oh, like college. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh. oh, I wonder if he turned out to, be, do, you, do you know what happened to him? Yeah. I mean, he's living he's a very successful uh consultant yeah you know i i wonder because i i mean it's not i don't know if it compares to this but i i knew a kid in high school who um would do really daring but like sexual things it, i went to an all boys school a prep catholic prep school and um and he, he he masturbated to completion in the back of the class that was kind of like his for a while claimed Did everyone fame. know about oh this? yeah yeah and the difference t- between an all-girl school and an all-boys <laughs> school the all-boys school was terrifying oh, like it was not pleasant to walk I through bet. but then the teachers find out about this <laughs> Um, I don't think they did. I think he did it. He was able to do it because we had some teachers who were a little tuned out. Like I had a Latin teacher. God bless him. He was so sweet, but he was kind of it all. He would talk like this. He was sort of like, um, who did he sound like? A, a little bit like Robert Evans. Remember Robert Evans? Uh, the producer. But he kind of, he taught Latin and he would talk, and he would just read out of a book like this. He looked like an old owl and he would just, uh, and, uh, uh, the, the first declension is a, a, or a, a you know, and. And all the kids, because he was looking down most of the time, is me. And we used to do a thing where we would just inch our our desks up <laughs> little by little. Until we were like, when he'd look back up, we'd be right in front of him. And he'd go, that's why Cicero was, all right, what's going on? And we were like <laughs> inches away from him. We were all just crowded in. And he would go, oh, all right, I'm calling the dean. But he didn't want to call. We knew he didn't. This is also a lesson in parenting. Because. We knew his intention was, and he never would call the dean, but he'd, he'd walk all the way across the room to the phone to like, I'm going to do it. And then we'd quickly move our desk back and he'd pick up the phone and he'd go, all right. He'd see that we had moved back. He'd go, all right. But anyway, my point is we had teachers who weren't totally um So aware. you were all Present. scooching closer. He was just- Just reading. Uh, masturbating but, in the back? Well, I don't know if that was in Latin class, but there were teachers who were a little t- tuned out and, and I th- he must have done it when in one of those classes. He also- I mean, this is disgusting. But that guy, uh, the reason I mention it is I'm like, well, what, where is he now? He, be- he became a, uh, like a Hollywood executive. Yeah. That feels he, fitting. He, yeah. He became like a, um, and, and I really, I, I know this sounds like, I like him a lot. He was, uh, he, I, I had a meeting with him in, in, I don't know if he still is, but this was a couple, this is maybe 10, 10 years ago. I had a meeting and like in a position of like a high position. And he said to me, and we caught up a little bit before and he goes, or maybe it was after, but I remember him being relieved and he said, he was like, thanks, but kind of like, thanks for, cause in the meeting I was like, they were like, oh yeah, you guys, what, you guys knew each other back then. And he, did he have like almost a terrified yes, feeling? Yes, like, yes, Don't, don't, don't. Yeah. I hope he doesn't say yeah. those things cause I'm sure he had some, sh- which, which is a good sign that he had some shame about it. But, but I guess we all did, you know, I guess we all did crazy shit back in the day. Not like that. I never masturbated yeah. in class, but, uh. Yeah, but he had he did have shame about it. Yeah, Why, but we did some weird things in high school. We did. Some I never weird masturbated things. in class. That's for sure. But there were, th- yeah, there were. We were. There's a lot of self exploration. Yeah, we definitely <laughs> were weird for sure. Yeah, what, yeah, and and again, if I had known that that I I wonder how different my sexual journey would have been if so, if I had felt comfortable like if if I'd felt like that wasn't shameful. You know, I don't think I'd be masturbating in class, but maybe. You know, maybe there's, there's a little bit of shame that's good. Maybe that's the lesson. Uh, yeah. You're like, how do you tell a kid, let's say, hypo- uh, hypothetically, you have a kid, you and Natalie have a kid, and, and they're, they're in school, they find, the teacher says, you know, little, um, little Lewis has been p- p- pulling down. He's, Lewis Vial. <laughs> Lewis Vial. Uh, yeah, it's, what would it be? Uh, uh, Vern. Vern Vial has been <laughs> pulling down, like, the other kids, like, girls' pants and, like, you know, because he's expressing, oh, God, and you can say, "Well, but but he'd be expressing." Would that be? It's just like a sexual curiosity. What would you say to Vern? Put me on the spot. Well, because Kay and I were talking about this, we were curious about like 
a, a, a hypothetical like that because I don't know I don't I wouldn't we, neither of us knew what to say what I and we would have to know here's what I don't want to happen I don't want our kid to be around that age and not be prepared for it I don't want the like yeah because like your dad had to have the talk with you be, because somebody pre preempted sure it. I guess I, like my first thought when you asked me it was just like uh, well I mean who wouldn't want their pants pulled down and so uh -huh. how do you keep teach your kid empathy? okay I'm your kid I'm your yeah. kid and and you you've just been told this by the parents hey hey dad um so what were you thinking Vern? so what well, was on your I mind just, well I, ju I just wanted to like see what was on your, their pants okay well, did you ask for their permission N no okay well but why do i have to i don't have to ask permission to to touch my own parts well that's because it's your body oh and 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 but if i so i should ask permission next time well for starters yeah okay i mean but but generally speaking, there's a girl i really like you her samantha you, I'm, I, so i'll just ask her if i can t yeah but it's, it's not very respectful what, yeah. What, I, yeah why isn't it respectful? i feel like i'm doing this all <laughs> I know. wrong i well, know well, oh god <laughs> but I, <laughs> parenting is hard I, <laughs> we might need to get some you, books <laughs> you got some time yeah uh i don't know yeah i just yeah you're you're so right though because in that moment i would be probably mortified embarrassed mm -hmm. and but the assumption is the kid doesn't know better he just right. did that he did an act yeah without realizing what he was doing you don't want to create weirdness around that yeah undo so weirdness. how do you how do you ride that? How line? do you teach them about, I don't know, I do remember my parents, like, t I remember my mom especially, it was really important for her to teach us that, like, our bodies were sacred and oh. we had to protect them. And Yeah. And how did she do that? She kind of just told us that, huh. you know, you know, with a, I had, I had a sister older and a sister younger, so I was a, you know, young boy and with own sister. So she was very careful about us, you know, being respectful of our bodies around each other and, mm. and shit like that. And, and oh, so right. I, I always just kind of had a, you know, a, just a, a modesty and maybe that was a kind of our Christian upbringing, you know, teaching yeah. us modesty I guess that's not a bad and, thing. And, and things like that. And you, know, you had older think, sisters. You yeah, had one older like sister. These kids, some of them are, are so innocent. You have no idea. But yeah. like, I also know, I remember a story of a girl in like first grade and another guy, a boy who was in first grade, went up to her in a hallway, like grabbed her butt and said, mm, that's nice. So I'm like, OK, well, that Whoa. was learned somewhere. Totally. That was either heard yeah. or seen right. either at home or on TV. Like, So then with that kid, what do you say? Because it's, exactly. it's not, it can't be I too late. They're still malleable. I, mean. I yeah. feel like it comes down to the difference between like shame and guilt, where guilt yeah. is like feeling uh -huh. bad about an action that you've done. And shame is feeling like you are bad as a person and oh, broken. And I think point. saying like. This act, like really helping, a ki explaining why an action is bad and then aligning how like I see you as someone who is very respectful of your friends. I see right. you as someone who shares. I see you as someone who makes people feel comfortable and happy. And this choice like made be and like kind of framing that choice as being like really outside of their identity. So that way it's kind of like. That's what I've, that's kind of what I was not as eloquently trying to touch on earlier about like you're not bad. Right. This right. choice was something we should look at and, and improve on i also totally. like want to make sure i keep, i want to make sure my like if i have kids with natalie now i'm yeah. i'm six two natalie is five ten her dad's mm. six five and oh, is the run to the litter her, her uncle's seven foot I oh suspect, my god now my dad's only five eight though so there's potential but huh i suspect we might have good size yes, kids yeah and so i just I want my kid to be a protector of other kids. Right. Like I, you know, mm -hmm. I don't want, and I remember I, I've always had this like guilty feeling at times growing up. I was, you know, and I, I was bullied at times in middle mm -hmm. school, but I also remember times where I saw other kids being bullied and didn't do anything about it. Oh, Nick. And I, and I, and I have this sense <laughs> yes. of guilt and I want to, I, if I am lucky enough to have kids, I want, I hope that my kid stands up for other kids in need. Yes, it's something I've thought a lot about. There's, you would love this. There's an essay by this writer, George Saunders, who wrote like Pastoralia, and, and he's just a great writer. But he wrote, it was the commencement speech for, I think, Rutgers University. And he talks about just that, his, his regret, like, because he's addressing this class of college kids. And, and I thought it was such a good opportunity to impart that kind of wisdom. What are the things you, you and he said the, 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 he'd said that the regret he has is not um, his failure to act when he could have like stood yeah. up. For, and I think about that often and I'm going to brag about my wife for a second. One of the many things I love about her and, and I remember learning this about her early on was that she is, um, 
she's such a kind person, but she's also very brave. And 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 I say that because to stand up for kids when you're when you're young, when you're going through, when you're being socialized and you're in school, it requires real courage to to do that. She to, she's she'll be embarrassed that I'm telling these stories, but she um. It's two things. One time saw like that a girl wasn't, one of her classmates wasn't being invited to a sleepover. The popular girl had invited Kate and a bunch of girls in front of this other girl. And, and Kate said, oh, I, I it's noticed, recognized that, saw, clocked the girl's sadness and said, you know what? I'm actually having, told her like, I'm going to have a sleepover. I had a sleepover with that girl and some other girls who weren't invited just so they would be included. And, and like, oh, I, that's could, awesome. oh, I could cry thinking about it. And she yeah. did this during a time where it's, uh, to your point, like I f- fantasize about, you know, if I were to go back and do things differently and if I, I would stand up for those kids, I, 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 I remember them by name and I remember like instances where I was just silent. I didn't pick on the kids, but I didn't say you anything, didn't do anything, you know, yeah. and another instance with Kate where she was um, a, a boy who was neuroatypical, who was um, uh, disabled, was asking some of the girls to go to the dance with him at a, at a, at a football game or something and they were all turning him down you know in in varying degrees of politeness no I, that's sweet of you but i and and kate marched over to him and, and said i would love to go to the prom with you you know and and went to like her school dance with this you know did the whole thing and 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 these were stories that i learned like gradually over time she wasn't like bragging about it but but they speak to her a character her character yeah. t- t- totally that's that's incredible i i how yeah, she's how do you incredible. what does she attribute that to because i do you think that. that's like a kind of like it's something she's born with is it parenting that you know her parents could speak to because that I, that that is an incredible story uh, uh, yeah because i think more people are like you and i Totally. To 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 have the regret and and to be old enough or mature enough to say I I wasn't brave enough. Well, it, because I was more concerned about fitting in and I was more worried about you know myself yeah. rather than someone else when I had no reason to be and there were other people uh-huh. who who needed that mm. and and then and to realize and then the self awareness to think about the times where you might have been bullied or picked on realizing it it wasn't a fraction as bad as some other people who experienced it oh, yet yeah. and, and and the trauma that we bring forward you know with the bullying that like we we experience yeah. and you can and then you have this kind of like holy shit I mean if, and and then you realize just how pivotal those moments could have been and would have been for those people that you would have helped that she in those moments actually did yes and I- I there there's she sent me a clip recently that that just made me weep. It was it was about um in Japan they teach uh they teach kindness to others to when when they're kids. They teach how to share and and um how to kids will stand up. They they show them. There's the footage of kids like offering their own seat to other kids and and you know there's they 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 teach an awareness of others which um I, I saw that in Ecuador. In Ecuador, there was, you know, there, there's this main city of Quito. There's, um, there's a real hustle and bustle, but everyone is kind of like in, in a flow with each other. They're not beeping or yelling at each other. Everyone's kind of playing. Very few people on their phones. It, it was, I saw that. I see that when I travel usually. And um, I love seeing it, but I don't know how you cultivate it early. I don't know how Kate is. I know that her mother is very kind and loving and, I think she just had, because I'd ask her about it, where it came from. And I think she just has a real sense of in, injustice and, 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 and a kindness. She is, I don't know, she's got a real like compassion. Early on, I would make some, I found myself making some snarky jokes and I, I, I recognized them as snarky only because she, they were some of the very few things she didn't laugh at, you know, and she, and, and I had to, I examined them and I, and I, and I found that they had like a kernel of meanness in them. And that was her cutoff. That's where we kind of like diverted, di- diverged from one another. Was hmm. that we, we, our sense of humor is so we're very similar. But but I found that I had a little bit more of a gossipiness or a snarkiness, and and I, I recognized it only because of her um, silence, you know. And and she wouldn't judge me. Uh, there'd be times where she'd be like, "Huh." I would examine it because it was a point of f- fracture in, in our and I. I consider her such a great barometer of what is funny. <laughs> she would almost like that kind of observant parent almost where she would not huh, criticize be, you, but just go, 
Hmm. Yeah, there would just be like a yeah. I had a boss yeah. who would every time I would I he would just say, hmm. Yeah. That's interesting. And I would huh. know that I, I needed Crossed to make line. an adjustment. That's you funny. know, or something. He would not necessarily he'd just go, hmm. I like that way of of, of setting boundaries. You know, it was a it, it, I guess if nothing else, it was an opportunity for me to see if I could self correct. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. And what a gift. Yeah. Instead of like someone Come, like it gets back to what we were talking about earlier. If you, if she were to have shamed me, if she would have said, oh, you know, I think that's really fucking mean and you should examine that. There'd be, I know I would probably. You'd be like, why is that mean? What are you talking I'd about? I'd become yeah. defensive. Yeah. Yeah. And, and not learn, not grow. Tell yeah. me like she's going to be a great parent someday. Ah, uh, she's going to be the best. What's your yeah. favorite thing about your relationship? <laughs> do you know, so we were, I, I, I thought, what, what do I distill a relationship? We were thinking about this because, um, why was I thinking about this? That I can distill it down to just enjoying, just loving being around her. I, I've, I've neglected some friendships lately because, um, and I've been examining that. I read this great book to call, uh, by Dr. Marissa Franco, wrote a book called Platonic, which is all about platonic friendships and the importance of them and how we, we place a lo- a less of an importance on them uh, just because of a, I don't know, social hierarchy of what you know, love is supposed to be. And, like, and so I, I've been ex- trying to examine some of them and I found that I've been wondering why I haven't been as active in those friendships. And I, I think this is going to sound insulting to my friends. I, I love them, but I, I just love being with her so much so that when, when we are together, I, I, I don't, it's hard to imagine doing other things. You know, I like, I just like being around her. So, um, but why I think it's because we just, um, I, I value, I value humor. I value comedy. I value, um, uh, introspection and, and curiosity, things like that. And, and she, I, I, I love doing those things with her. You know, I just love her brain and, and, um, and her body. Uh, but I love, I just feel really safe with her, you know? I, I love that word. Yeah. Safe. I mean, it's, it's even, it's even bled into like, I feel, yeah, safety is, I, I never really understood the importance of that. It, it always just felt like a, a, a word that people throw around, an idea that people throw around, kind of like an, a, an abstract thing that, I don't know, I never really, because I think I never truly had it, you know. I'm still close with a lot of exes and, and uh, most of my exes. And, and um, so I, I really, and I have so much love for them, um, all of them. But uh, she said to me once, like, you know, because we had a moment of like, I, I don't know, a point of, where I wasn't examining something that I should have been, and I was being defensive, I was being, being, being really reactive. I forget what it was. Um, it was early on, and she said, and she said it without any judgment, um, which is important. She said, "Have you ever been in like a real, loving, reciprocal relationship? You know, like a real relationship?" And I was like, and I was forty. Well, I was no, I'm sorry, I was forty three, and I was like, Pfft. and my instinct was to say, "Yeah, I have." Hey, fuck you. Like, you know, I'm, I'm a grown man. I'm a middle-aged man. But I, I, I did think about it really because of the way she asked it. Cause, cause I, I, and I, and I, I, did, I don't know if I had truly. Yeah. Uh, it's an interesting question. Cause yeah. you, I think, yeah, young love. I think you, I don't know if you really, I, I would use the word safe often when describing my relationship with Natalie because and I never, you're right. That, that word was not something I would, uh, use because it was just, I, I like the, the danger too. I like the like. Oh, I don't know if I'm, you know. Yeah, well, because I, I think young love or my relationships early before, you know, forty. I guess it was. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was. It was less of a partnership. It was less of teammates. It was right. You, I, I still felt like an individual. Yes, dating some another individual because, you know, a lot, lot more fighting or just conflict. And yes, it was as easy to trigger your partner, and then all of a sudden you know, you're, you're fighting for the sake of fighting as opposed to like feeling disconnected. Like now when Nally and I fight, there's more of a, it doesn't feel like we're fighting. It feels like we're disconnected. Yes. That's a, and not aligned. I like yeah. using that word. And so, you know, and then I, and I learned this and we, something we, we, I learned this in therapy and something we uh-huh. incorporate is like, if after 10 minutes we're still fighting about the same thing and uh-huh. we're, we're repeating our arguments, yeah. one of us will just say, like literally just call a timeout. Uh-huh. And to say, well, well, you gotta table this because that's when you are you're 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 ch- you're fighting you're in your child's totally state. emotional. So it's yes. all emotional. You're mm-hmm. you're 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 fighting for the sake of fighting. 
And as frustrating as it is to have the other person call the timeout, because it feels like oh, but I got more to say. You feel a bit stonewalled a little bit, but yeah. we know the intent. And then one of us, usually the person who calls the timeout, is the one who like comes over to the other person and kind of says like, "I love you," and uh-huh. and and know that you're still mad, but like you both kind of agree to like, well, we're gonna circle back to this maybe tomorrow, maybe another day, but like, and then. It's, it really does help because totally. I remember so many yeah. fights that I've had with past partners. It would last 45 minutes, mm. 90 minutes. And you don't, you don't even know what you're arguing about. Well, you talk in circles. That's and, the but you're just trying to win. Yes. And then it becomes about childhood stuff. So it's like, yeah. I, I, I love examining that stuff. I don't know that I was ever c- committed. I don't mean like in terms of not be, being, being faithful in terms of like sexually. Like I could commit. To, to those, to that, I could, I could do that, but I always, I didn't, I never felt free. I, I didn't felt, feel, to, I always felt like, um, uh, in, when I was in a relationship, I always felt like uh, that was what scared me about commitment because commitment to me was synonymous with not being free, was losing some kind of freedom. And now I, I, I actually, I feel more, <laughs> sounds cheesy. I feel as free as I've ever felt alone because of the safety that this person like uh, offers because there's no judgment there's no i can me- i know i can mess up and 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 not be um discarded or you know not be uh, in trouble i'm cur- i'm curious about that how best to communicate how best to uh to to move forward in an argument and and i think that's helped me a lot is a 3 second rule i i've implemented this 3 second rule so i i do it in traffic so, to avoid reactivity so i'll i'll, I'll literally like count in my head th- 3 seconds and and it's made a world of difference. Really? Uh, so you feel triggered and uh, you I want the self awareness to go one, two, three. And Fuck it, you, asshole. It no. changes it everything. Does change. No, it does. Think yeah. about it. It try it next time. It's not always easy, and I, I don't always succeed, but but um it 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 really because to your point, like you get to the point where you don't know what you're arguing about. And it's Or when you're really reactive about whatever and you have a outburst, and yes. then you feel that you feel like a shame. Oh. You're just like, fuck. I, was, I, I, like I have the, I had the right to be mad, but I did not have the right to do that. Yes. Yeah. I, I that's one of the reasons I like watching reality TV. Cause I, I see these fights happen. I've been watching the ultimatum. Do you watch the ultimatum? Yeah. We oh, haven't gotten into the queer. I haven't, I haven't had a chance to watch. I've been so bogged down with Vanderpump, but have, are you <laughs> so watching the queer? Good. We you just watch, started the queer. The you, you just started queer ultimatum. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's good. Yeah. It's really good, but it's, you see where a lot of these, they're actually a lot better. I don't know what that says. I don't want to make a stereotype queer people versus straight people, but they seem a lot healthier the, the, in terms of their communication skills uh, on, on this season. Of- yeah, because I think there's not like like scripts or like kind of autofill settings. Like I think being socialized in like a very like heterosexual, heteronormative world, all that stuff, like you have just like all these presets or like at least from my experience, like starting to date women, it was like, oh, wow, all these like presets I didn't realize existed actually aren't applicable here because we don't have these like gender roles or these scripts to fall back on. And so because of that, you're like not doing autofill settings you're going through and customizing. And so I think there's just inherently a bit more like thoughtfulness and like consideration. And is it because it's... I do also think there's a level of like, well, I think, yeah, especially like other queer women, like I think I just really connect with them just in terms of being like, oh, we've probably had certain parallels of like, Ex- like lived experiences yes, yeah. and with like moving through the world in certain ways and being treated certain ways and having reactions to that. And so I think there's maybe like a little bit of like that, like you come at it from maybe more of a place of like a shared reference point. Now, do, do you think in general, because I wonder ha- now having, having been in a, like a very healthy, safe relationship where, where like proposing to somebody was n- not even, there was no struggle. There was no, it was. It just felt like such a fluid, natural thing. It just felt like an obvious, like breathing. I'm going to take my next breath. I'm going to take my next breath with this person. But people who are reluctant to marry, which is what the show is about. There's, you know, if, for those of you who haven't seen it, it's um, one person, one member of a couple gives the other one an ultimatum: either marry or we break up. And and it's then they're then they have to spend three weeks with another person. But I think in general, I, I struggle with the premise because. Having now gone through it, if if somebody is not willing, if someone's willing to go on a show called The Ultimatum because they're so reluctant to marry, can you ever get past that? I mean, yeah, I don't. You know what I mean? Does does that make sense? That if how do you convince somebody to 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 marry 
marriage to me seems like if you're going to make that lifelong commitment, it's got to be, people say like, oh, it's hard. You know, it's a struggle. And I, I don't know that it should be a struggle. I don't know. That's not, that's something I can struggle with. Like a dis- it, if it becomes like a real decision, I, should I ask or should we do this? You know, it, it seems I agree with you, except that I think the times have changed. Yeah. Because like back 20, 30 years ago, you know, mm-hmm. our parents, you know, there's much that, more traditional that playbook. You, know, you go to college, yeah, high yeah. school, whatever. You meet someone in your early 20s and you're in love. That's you get married. Yeah. And now we're everyone's dating hookup culture. Everyone's settling down later in life. Everyone's like, take your time. Yeah. Yada, yada. And and with the indoctrination of dating apps, hookup culture and just waiting in general. Now the idea of the pressures of perfection, I think, are, are, are have never been stronger when it comes hmm. to finding relationships. But maybe that's not necessarily bad. I don't think that's not necessarily bad. But I think, um, I think it's it be. I think then I guess in my mind it seems more acceptable, or at least I understand why more people might be like, ah, like I love you, but like, are we ready? I don't know. Marriage. It seems so like permanent and things I see like what that. You're saying. And it's just more. I think, I I guess what I'm saying is like the what you mentioned. It's like, well, I don't want to ever have to convince someone to propose to yeah. me and things like that. And I think back in the day, there were so many people who got engaged, and it seemed you know, and and no one was you know seemingly convinced to do it. But when you think about it, it was society convinced them? Yeah, and sure. Pro, the pro, you know, it was this life convinced them. This is I'm I'm uh, of course. Now, how many things did we do in our twenties? But because like I'm doing this because I. I, I'm supposed to. Yeah, I, sure. I should do this. Yeah. You know, like any girlfriend I had in my 20s where we dated for over a year, I'm like, I guess I should start thinking about proposing to you. Yeah, you know, that's and I, true. I had no self awareness of like <laughs> us if we were happy. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Know, or, or well, things that, like that. that is funny. You lose sight of like the 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 real basic stuff. Yeah. But, so I think now, I yeah, I don't I don't you ever want to have to convince someone to do that, but I I think dating culture now is is, is unfortunately. Uh, again, that, that, that pressure of perfection and making sure that, you know, you know everything about someone and it's such a fine line between taking your time and getting to know someone and then realizing like forever is just, it, you're, you're making a bet. You are making a bet on someone. That's and, true. That yeah. is true. And I, but I, I feel lucky that I waited. For example, like I, I'm lucky that I live in a culture like we have now. That, oh yeah. That there was not that, you know, my parents are Catholic and so of course they, they were putting pressure on, but not enough. It wasn't, it wasn't, they're my parents and I was like a grown, grown up. And so I didn't feel enough pressure to like acquiesce to their wishes, you know, and like <laughs> marry the first you know person that I, I, I had been with for a while. So I, I am glad I waited and I, and I knew, and I was single for a while. I, I'm glad I like spent three years being really single and, I, and, and recognizing that I was happy on my own and, and I didn't feel this pressure to of course i wanted kids and all that stuff but i i had been in enough unhealthy relationships um to know that that uh, to 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 take that pressure off of i like i didn't want to be just in a relationship to be in one you know yeah again i was i thought i'm never going to do that okay and i call them never again you know like we we look back on relationships we've had and kind of compare notes and think and and there's so so many things that it's not shame but i think had i known the things i know now i would have spent less time in some of them you know and 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 i'm glad i learned them and they're and they're real pillars now of, of things that i i i won't uh t- tolerate and i won't you know tolerate in my life like in, in any relationship but i think it took being in a lot of things being in different ones and and being on my own for a while to to know that for sure so i think um i guess what i'm, <laughs> guess what I'm saying is if you have doubts if you're s- struggling I, I, I think that's the answer is that then you should go, you should try to find, because the, it should be, I think, a no brainer. I don't think it should be a, str- and maybe this is just very personal. Like it, it wasn't a struggle for me. Yeah. Once I found, once it was like, that's, and I, and I would hear that for years, like when you know, you know, and, and it really was like that in my experience. I just don't know if everyone, I don't, I, I agree with you because I, I, I don't mean, want to sound we're, superior. We're similar in that sense where we waited so long that mm-hmm. like I've, I was at a different state of maturity and emotional, like, un, you know, self-awareness. Yeah. But I don't know if we, uh, everyone can have that luxury. You of know, just, of the knowing. Of just, or just being that part of it is, you know, for me, I, I, I became single in my thirties mm-hmm. and had that kind of, so, then 
the self confidence to not feel that in my twenties I had this pressure of always needing to have somebody, mm-hmm. and then in mm-hmm. my thirties I didn't feel that pressure, which allowed me to stay basically single throughout my thirties. Yeah, Is that, I don't want to be with someone for the sake of being someone. Yeah, and then I could be patient to find the right person. And then when you when you met Natalie, like was did it was there a moment like that? Was there a moment? Because I had a moment, and and it was we were friends. We nothing. We hadn't touched. We hadn't. It it was, but it was a moment of knowing, of like real conviction, and it was very soon in where I where I thought, well, this is somebody I'm gonna like love in some capacity for the rest of my life. I'm gonna think about your answer, and then we're gonna do our great. caller. Oh, great! And then I'm gonna answer your question after okay. our caller. Okay, great. So great. time for is it texting office hour? What are we? Set it up, mediation. Amanda. Yeah, it's well, like a, it's it's sort of a mediation, but I would say text. We do have a text. We have some primary sources to okay. go off of. So oh. in that way, texting off. It's a meaty hours. call, Justin. Oh, Ashante. good. Yeah. Oh, I'm excited. How's it going? Hello. Uh, my name is Sarah, and I'm 29. And I'm Mark, 32. Okay. And how can we help? Well, since an argument I had with my brother-in-law, his brother in March, he's been ghosting me and not talking to me. Uh So he's completely shut you out. Yes, it would appear so. What's what's the backstory? Well, he was over here um, back in March after dinner. We were just kind of talking and he mentioned he started to bring up his girlfriend that he had broken up with. And I kind of get uncomfortable every time he talks about her. And and, because it's a relationship that's been over for a while and he keeps bringing her back up. Long story short, um, it got to a point in the conversation where he said, um, from your perspective, what could I have done better in that relationship? Mm -hmm. And I said, well, you've asked me this question before and you don't seem to like my answer. Is there another question that you want to ask me? And he just kind of I don't remember exactly what he said, but it felt like he was kind of talking in circles a little bit. And then eventually was like, I've just done so much improvement and I've really worked on myself and I'm in a way better place now. And so I kind of challenged it and said, are you sure? Like, are you really? Because you're still here six months later asking me the same question. And he didn't like that. And so he said, I think I need to leave. And he got up and left. Um, And then after that, I went in because my husband was inside. And so I went in and I asked or I told told him kind of like what happened, gave a breakdown of the conversation. And he said, well, it sounds like you were probably being a little too pushy. And so I ended up sending him my brother-in-law, like a long apology text being like, I'm that, so sorry. Yeah. Is that what we have here? Why don't we have Justin yeah. read it? Yeah, I'd yeah. love to. I can do. Uh, so J- I, Justin's going to do a dramatic reading. So this will be, this is, I, I'm not going to try to do your voice, Sarah, because I'm not, I love doing impressions, but um. <laughs> I, I, it's hard for me to do women, female voices, unless they're k- kind of closer to my range. So I just need a little disclaimer like to everyone me. listening. <laughs> um, uh, I want you to know I'm sorry and I love you. No, no, that's uh, my bad, Sean Connery. Uh, I, okay, I'm going to read it. That's, this is no, no more joking. Although I'm tempted to read it like Christopher Walken, I'm just going to read it like myself. I want you to know I'm sorry and I love you. Mark tells me that I push too much, and after talking with him, I realized that I did that to you. I know you've been through so much, and I never want you to feel like you can't tell me things. I just know you've made so much progress, and when you asked me that question again, it reminded me of where you were several months ago, and I kind of panicked and didn't know what to do, so I just got pushy instead of listening to you and supporting you, and that was wrong. I should have been more supportive and done more listening instead of talking. I'm so sorry. I love you. Heart emoji. Another text. I also want you to know that there's no need to respond, but I will plan on giving you space until you let me know you are ready. I'm really so sorry. I love you. I want you to know you mean so much to me and our family. I I truly love you so much and only wish to support you. And I am so sorry my actions didn't display that tonight. I promise to learn from this experience and will do better in the future. Very nice text and no response, I'm assuming. No response. And then um, a couple months later, I sent a text inviting him to a family Easter and was like, hey, would you like to come? We'd be great to have you. Mm. And no response to that either. Mm. Mark, is he also ignoring you? Well, we don't really talk that much anyways. (laughs) But uh, I did see him the other day. uh, I think it was two days ago. And just spoke with him briefly in person. Uh, But yeah, we have a a fine relationship. No, No hard feelings with us. 
but it sounds like you and 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 brother-in-law had a bit of a connection or a bond or you were like the go-to person he would talk to about some of his relationship problems yeah i feel like i mean i'm just naturally like a more chatty person and so sometimes he would talk to me about things going on in his relationships or like if he was going to ask us a, a question he would usually text both of us or like he would maybe even text me sometimes and say like hey will you ask mark this or do you and mark want to do this he would oftentimes uh-huh. go to like me first but i'm also just more inclined to respond sure. faster in text too <laughs> and, and what was the dilemma that he was going through that kind of triggered him um he had this breakup um that was I, just really hard for him i think it was kind of i don't know i think it was pretty tough on him i'll interject a little bit with that it's he had a relationship he was dating this girl for i don't know maybe approximately a half year to a year i don't Maybe I should probably know the dates, but I don't. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> and I guess it got a little tumultuous and they just kind of split up. It was just kind of a hard breakup and with no no conclusion, no mm-hmm. explanations. I, I think that my brother wanted something uh, like to talk, to discuss like, yeah. what happened yeah. and why. This, this is sort of a foreign thing for me because I, I, I'm so close with my brother, both of my brothers. And so I sense a little, there's not that there's anything dramatic between you two, Mark, uh, you and your brother, but I guess, what is the reason for the, um, is there a disconnect between you and your brother that, uh, why aren't you guys all that? It doesn't sound like you're that close. No, I would say it's more of our upbringing. Uh Uh-huh. It's hard to, it's kind of hard to describe why we wouldn't be close as far as more of maybe the relationship relationship that we had with our parents. Oh. That kind of caused us to be more reserved. Um, huh. Would you like more... to be closer with him? Do you do you aspire to to more a closer relationship with him? Yeah, I'll say yes. Yeah, yeah. but um, it almost is it when you say your upbringing is it like you are you like almost close in your way that you're comfortable, but you're but maybe less communicative in terms of like you. There's things you just don't talk about. There are things that we just don't talk about. Sure, there are also things that. Whenever we do talk about, um, I've been able to maybe verbalize a little bit better. Yeah. And whenever I try to have conversations with him about these types of things that are obviously impacting him today, uh, he kind of shuts down. And I huh. think that's kind of where we go back to uh, Sarah and, and his relationship and how he reacted to her kind of challenging him a little bit. So, um, so, so Mark, have you been tempted to reach out to him and just say, Hey, listen, you two are very like the most important people to me, my, my wife and my brother. You know, I would love to understand the, the point of disconnect between you and Sarah. And I'm here. You know, have you had that? Um, have you had that communication with him? Uh, I have not. And Sarah and I actually discussed this uh, maybe the day after or within the week of. But ultimately, me knowing my brother is just something that he won't be very receptive to. Why do you think that is? I mean, it just, it sounds like, I, I, I asked that only because it sounds like he was being vulnerable with Sarah, which it sounds like that's a difficult thing for him to be, to be vulnerable, which is maybe why he goes to Sarah instead of you, which is something to explore. But he was vulnerable and, and it sounds like- He felt shut down. He felt shut down and he got, def- it sounds like he got really defensive and he's, and we, sh- I, I th- he shut down, we were talking about that earlier in the show, we, we to protect ourselves, something happened. In our childhood, it's a defense mechanism. So his shutting down is the result of some probably childhood thing. But I'm I'm wondering what caused him to shut down, and I wonder if it has something to do with him being vulnerable and then it not being reciprocated properly. And you you, you touch on this in your text that you were too pushy and you weren't. You you said you kind of panicked, you kind of panicked and didn't know what to do. Um, so so you got pushy instead of listening and supporting. What why why is it that you you chose that word panic? I think like the conversation just made me a little uncomfortable. Like I said, like when he, when he brings up the breakup with his, him and his Mm ex-girlfriend, I really liked the ex-girlfriend. I like connected with her. And so when he says things about the breakup, you know, he obviously isn't speaking super highly of her. And so I get a little bit just uncomfortable. And then I also know too, like in those moments, 
I want to be direct because I yeah. think that's the best way to speak, but I'm not good at being direct. Huh. And so I tend to like, and that's why I like kind of came across pushy because I usually tend to overcompensate in those moments. Okay. I feel like my husband's that it's helpful when he's there because yeah. he can kind of balance that out and like correct in the moment when that happens. Huh. And so just him not being there and the topic of conversation, like it all just made me feel a little panicky. How many, like, I know you sent this message and he hasn't responded to it, but have you tried to reach out since then where he's, I know you mentioned Easter, Mm -hmm. but is he? That was the only other time. And then we also have a family birthday coming up that I was thinking about reaching out to him about and inviting him to, but I just. What yeah. about you just reaching out one-on-one and asking him to get coffee or something? Because I feel like inviting him to like a family event. Yeah, that's a good point. Might be from his standpoint, feel like, because now that you haven't spoken for a couple months, like every day that goes by becomes a bigger and bigger mm-hmm. deal. Mm-hmm. It's just like, you know, and so when you do yeah. see each other, there has to be some sort of like, I don't know, some conversation or something that he doesn't want to have or or feels awkward having but he tried to have a one-on-one conversation with you and maybe it almost sounds like from your standpoint that you you were that person he felt the most comfortable to have these types of conversations with Mm -hmm. and i'm just wondering if maybe you reach out to him and say hey i don't know if you're up for it i know we haven't talked in a while but i'd love to catch up with you one-on-one like are you down to grab lunch or or yeah or a cup of coffee and then maybe you guys could just hash it out one on one without the pressures of anyone else observing or or being around you guys because you know you mentioned upbringing and things like that it, it sounds like you know Mark and and your brother-in-law aren't necessarily super comfortable with being vulnerable in in public settings or just in general and so when mm-hmm. y- you you kind of not that you did anything wrong per se like here he is being vulnerable he's not used to being vulnerable and you're just like he probably felt like you threw it in his face, you know, yeah. his, his vulnerability. It, it, I, it sounds like he shut down because it's that, that childhood instinct kicked in and was like, well, now I'm going to protect myself. I'm never, I'm not going to talk about this. And there's probably yeah. a hurt. There's probably a sense of like real hurt. And the fact that you were, def- sounds like somewhat defending, he's struggling with ha- this breakup. And the fact that you weren't just completely open to letting him talk and vent and work it through that there was some, and I'm not saying it's what, you know, you're entitled to your own reaction, um, but it sounded like maybe you, you, you spooked him a little bit and he shut back down. Um, yeah, I 100% think I did. And yeah. this is a great text. I, I really love, like, it's, it sounds really, it's very evolved and it's loving, but I, the, the thing that I'm, I'm attached to now in this text, because I just went through something like this with my family, m- my, my younger brother um, and my parents withheld some information from him that was very important because they didn't want to hurt him. It's, I, I know I'm being vague about it. It's cryptic, but I have to keep it that way. But the point is they, in their, they're in their seventies and eighties, they felt horrible about this and they wanted to apologize. And so, and I've, I've gotten, I'm not very good at many things, uh, but I, I've gotten over in my life, I think pretty good at apologizing of, of accountability, like real mm-hmm. accountability. And, um, and the thing that I bumped on a little bit in your text was when you did say, you said, I'm, I'm, here's why I did it. You know, I'm sorry I did this. But it, when you asked me the question again, it reminded me of where you were several months ago and I panicked and didn't know what to do. So I just got pushing instead of listening to you. You do say what you should have done, but even offering that as an explanation, it sometimes diminishes real accountability. Like sometimes people, because he's hurt and he's angry in that position, in his situation, just what they want to hear, I fucked up. I just right, fucked yeah. up and I should have listened and I regret that without the, I did it because of this. And I think he may, I don't know. I, I, I wonder if he's holding on to that. And I wonder if like Nick said, an in-person full accountability, I just, you were being vulnerable and I should have been there for you. And I'm, you know, I'm sorry to, to maybe repair this. It might require real, real vulnerability on your part. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I think that that's something that I struggle with in general is like, mm-hmm. I almost want to like defend myself of in course. an apology and be like, I'm not all bad. I of promise course. I messed up There's this time. There's shame. Well, because yeah, it's, yeah. you're, it's you're apologizing for something that was well-intentioned, you yeah. know, and that's hard yeah. to do to, 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 uh, why do I have to apologizing when I actually, I meant well, you know, I was trying to help. I, and it's hard yeah. to, to say my bad. 
I see these moments as like a real opportunity now, you know, like you have a real mm-hmm. opportunity to, when you say the hard things, it, it, it yields such like beautiful things. I, I say this only from, I say this from experience is that I've, um, and I've been on both ends, you know, I've wronged people and I've, and I've been, a, when you are a con- when it's hard. It's like, we were talking about jumping out of planes earlier and my wife always likes to say like, you grip the hardest before letting go. And there is a real letting go in that kind of vulnerability. If you were to just lay yourself bare, um, it's something he was attempting to do, I think w- with you and it was, it was not reciprocated. So, and that can, that can lead to very childish reaction, reactions because we can protect ourselves. Um, so I think, I think if you were to let go and really be totally vulnerable, I mean, look, what you did wasn't, wasn't you didn't commit some like horror, like you didn't do the most egregious thing. You just probably weren't as open as, as you, as you should have. You should have been. You could have been. And also, my guess is, and this is just a total guess, but his not speaking to you right now has probably less to do with you, and probably more right. to do with the fact that he's his feelings on the topic hasn't evolved or changed. So he's probably still hurting, or still has the similar thoughts and opinions about the breakup. You know, and he is going to assume that while you are sorry, you push that you still feel this way. Yeah. About the situation. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, yeah. and so if you do sit down, maybe you just say, hey, you know, and I, assuming it, if this is true, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but like, you just say, listen, I, you know, what I do miss is being the person you felt most comfortable mm-hmm. opening up to. Mm-hmm. That's, and yeah. more than anything, I just want to go to a place where you feel comfortable. So how, how can I be that person? Mm. Like, how can I be someone like I ultimately when you're vulnerable with me or when you open up, I, I want. I want to help, and even if helping is just listening. Mm-hmm. But like mm-hmm. with your permission, how how can I also respond? Like just just ask. Like ask how how do they want you to be? I've had to learn that in relationships Me too. Where it's too. just like, My well, God. It's, what do you want? Like what do you want? Like how how? Because we're fixers. What do you want me to do in this situation? Yeah. And I sometimes I'll just ask because I don't want to presume that they that they they they, they want a specific type of reaction. Yeah. And so yeah. maybe you could try that with him. I, I went through it. Sometimes when you really, to your point, reduce things to their essence, like what is the essence of your hurt? Um, I, I forget his name, Jet, uh, whatever his name is. What is the essence? What, what, what is it that if you can reduce it to that? And my wife and I, we went through a very challenging time. Um, we were dealing with something very difficult. We, we, we did a, a therapy session together and, and, our therapist said, what do you, you know, ask each other what you need. And it, it sounded kind of silly at first, but I, we were in a state of, I was needing guidance at that point. So she said, ask each other what you need. And, um, and it's yielded such like it, it, that it's, it sounds so simple, you know, but, but often I, I've failed to do that in relationships, reduce it to that. What, what do you need from me? So if you were to say that in a way that is open and without any judgment or preconceived, you know, any agenda, if you just say to your brother-in-law, what do you need from me in the future? To, like, as you said, to feel safe and to, yeah. feel, to feel like you can come to me. Cause I, cause that is a privilege. Like it's, it's kind of a beautiful thing that he trusted you with, with his vulnerability. And, um, and, and it's, and six months, I know it sounds like, well, it was probably like, Correct me if I'm wrong, but like I've been hearing so much about this breakup and it was six months ago and it's like, get over it already. And you're vilifying this girl that I don't think this woman who doesn't deserve it. Um, but but he's still processing it. Those things can take a while sometimes. Yeah. I and, wish I knew and, all the details. But may, and maybe you could say it's just like, again, I kind of justice, but you want to be careful not to try to justify it. But you can say when you have that conversation, how how can I be help? You could say, well, can I ask you a question? And I ask for their, you know, but like. Because it seems like he's just stuck. How old is, how old is, how old is he? Uh, 34. He's 34. Okay. Mm-hmm. What do you think he would say to you if you were to say, why haven't you spoken to me in so long? I mean, I, I don't recommend doing that, but, but what, do you, what do you think his thought process is? I don't know. Mark, you, you, might have yeah. so, you must have some. If you, were, if, you, <laughs> yeah. if you were to ask a blunt question like that, mm-hmm. uh, well... As as it's kind of been alluded to before, you know, he whenever he feels like he is being challenged, he will vilify the other person. Mm. Uh, so ultimately, I feel like he would end up 
maybe attacking Sarah a little bit. I see. So he's not open to his own accountability. He's not really, he's right. not good at a, a accountability himself. So it's almost like you kind right. of see where oh. his ex was coming from. Yeah. Let's just yeah. say the, the way that he painted the breakup is questionable. And it's like, huh. and it's tough because I'm getting his side of the story and like, I don't have hers. And like, mm-hmm. how we always say, you know, there's three sides to each story. Sure. And, you know, and so it's just like, the whole thing sometimes is just uncomfortable. And I, yeah, I just, I feel like I have a hard time being, telling myself, okay, just listen. Like you don't have to voice your opinion yes. right now. That's and been a, hmm, that's been a big lesson. For, yeah. Yeah. I, that's been a big lesson for me in relationships is that because I'm a, I'm a middle child. So I'm a fixer. I want things to like, I'm a people pleaser and a fixer. And I just want to, I want things to be okay as quickly as possible. And a big lesson I've learned is that it's okay for it not to be okay. It's okay to sit for a little while in the not okay. And it's okay to not be able to fix things. Sometimes people just need to vent. People just need to yeah. like get things out and to, and to feel held in, in doing so, you know, to, they, they just want to be in a safe space. Now it's a little different when like, it's your brother and he's saying things that are not aligned with growth, like his own growth. And you know, I know you want your yeah. brother, I want that for my brother. I, you want them to be happier and better people and if they're if they're stuck in in, in um in a place where they're not open to their own you know growing themselves it, that can be frustrating i know that frustration i feel like that's a hundred percent it like mm. when i'm listening to him talk about it mm-hmm. if i feel like i see him verbalizing things that are going to kind of keep him stuck instead of growing and moving forward and so i don't I, I have like a hard time finding like yeah. a soft way to like encourage that. Yeah, yeah. Moving forward. So does he, what does he claim? Well, like, yeah, what did he should... claim? Did he claim at that moment that was he like venting because he was he, does he claim he wanted closure or was he claiming about like not wanting to move on? Like, was he still trying to get her back or like in what, what was his state of mind as the relationship goes, you know, getting over it, moving on or getting her back? Um, definitely not getting her back. Okay. I, okay. I don't know. I would say it's a combination of getting closure while also maybe trying to get her back. So his ego was bru- obviously like quite. And I think like, I think there is a lot of it of trying to convince us or convince me that like to be upset with her just as much as he is. I see. Be on his side. Yeah. Like be on his side and. And I would like, and I, there's even a point where, you know, I even said like, I'm on your side. Like I, you know, I believe you, like, is there more from you that you need? And it was, I don't know. It was, it's just tough. Um, unfortunately, Sarah and Mark had some technical difficulties, but we will leave them some advice within the episode. So let's take it away. Well, it's an interesting position that they're in. We can talk about the position they're in and how, how, one in a similar position could move forward. I mean, what's the path forward other than, I mean, they have, see, now it's up to this guy, the bro- the brother-in-law to, to meet and to sit it's down. T- yeah, well, I, and I always have a hard time as much as I like helping yeah. people and having these conversations. I have a hard time helping people who don't want to help themselves. And he definitely seems like a person who's very stuck in, mm-hmm. in winning the narrative mm-hmm. of this breakup. Yeah, that's true. And, and it must be frustrating to be her, her to be on the other, the, 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 the advice giving. And when, when somebody doesn't really necessarily want advice, they just want to hear that they are right. Well, and yeah. And, and we see this, you know, you see this a lot too. And, and, you know, with the way all these words get thrown ar- around too, it's just, you know, like when, when people throw the word narcissism around, mm-hmm. we were talking about this before, where it's like someone called in a couple of weeks ago and they were just like, well, I think my ex was a narcissist. And I'm thinking <laughs> like, well, who gives a shit? They were your ex. Like, why are we? Well, I'll tell you what, I mean, it, it, it does help because there is a trauma. You, you need to unpack the trauma of being with a narcissist. If they actually were, but they were just like, well, I, I didn't realize and think about it until I saw something on the internet and, uh, and right. it sounded like maybe they're just like kind of being a selfish dick. Huh. And that's the thing. I think we, we, we assign we, certain terms and, and I think, you know, in cases where you're really dealing with someone, I think there can be real, real trauma. But mm-hmm. I think like, as we were talking about before, like if you go through a breakup, there's unfortunately arguing and yelling and, and maybe sometimes name calling and not that that's okay, but you know, we are human beings mm-hmm. and we, we have feelings. And when our feelings get activated, yeah, sure. we 
can raise you know, we can our tempers can escalate and and we can get mad and and express frustration yeah. and, and so we often have to apologize for those those moments of expressing frustration and i think sometimes we just we hang on to relationships we have a hard time accepting or over and letting go and the re- way we hang on to them is by vilifying them uh-huh. and then and then uh-huh. you know getting everyone around who knew them to mm-hmm. vilify them as well you know because it, it sounds because it, it sounds like to me she left him abruptly mm-hmm. And he didn't want it to end. Even even Mark mentioned mm-hmm. he's not even convinced he doesn't want to get back together with this person he's claimed was, you know, uh, not a good partner to mm-hmm. him. Yeah. And I think sometimes we, you know. Is that the ego? Is that the, yeah, th- just protecting I think so, well, Yeah. Or just like having a hard time letting go. Yeah. You know, and yeah. that's why, you know, granted there are real narcissists out there, but so many people now are. You know, oh, was I dating a narcissist because well, they were selfish? If you or, are it, curious, I just heard, not to keep plugging her podcast, but Glennon Doyle's podcast, We Can Do the Hard Things, uh, that second to last episode was about being with a narcissist. How do you know that if you're with a narcissist, if you've been with a narcissist, how do you know if you are a narcissist? And and uh, it's so fascinating. She had a woman on who wrote a, a book about it. She is like the, you know, narcissistic, narcissist professional. She had been married to a narcissist for 10 years and talks about her own experience and and it's fascinating. So if, if you're listening to this and you, you think, well, maybe I was with, um, it's worth a listen. We can do hard things. Second to last episode was, I, was I, and if you ask yourself, am I a narcissist? Cause I was like, listening to this, like, geez, I have some narcissist. I am an actor. We all have narcissistic yeah, yeah, narcissism in us. Does that make me a narcissist? And, and Abby, uh, Glennon's, uh, wife asked that very question. Cause she's really, she was like, oh, you know, I'm struggling with this thing now. Now I'm wondering if I am a narcissist. And and the, the expert was like, if, if, if you're, you're even, asking, if, yes, then yeah. your chances are you're not, you're, you're not, yeah. you're definitely not. If you, if you're wondering and if you're like, but it might be worth, um, I wonder what this, where this guy is on that spectrum. And I wonder if it's worth saying to him, Hey, look, I'm, I, I'm having a hard time, you know, being this person for you, which, which I want to be because he's not being accountable for his own shit. Even if, you know, you, you break up, even if you go through a breakup, you have to, I think that's another thing you learn over time. Um, what was what is my accountability in that relationship what what how did i participate in the dysfunction of that relationship and it sounds like he's not really there and that could be frustrating for people trying to um offer advice to somebody yeah like trying to win the breakup is right a- that's why i was wondering what is what do they lose if they just say as they're you know because it's it's his sister-in-law and it's his brother so maybe he's just looking for them to be like you're right she sucks we love you <laughs> no What's the harm in that? And maybe the harm in that is like, well, he doesn't really grow then if he's not accountable for his own participation. Well, that's, well, if, but if that's the question, then, you know, it's, do you just want to have a relationship with your brother-in-law? Right. At what she's cost? Not, she's not his therapist. Right. He's 34. She's not going to be, they, the couple, is not going to yeah. be the difference between him figuring his shit out You're or right. not. Right. You're right. And if he doesn't want. See, that's the fixer in me. He, yeah. If he doesn't want the help doesn't matter whether they're willing to give it or or not so can you have then it sounds like she sarah was struggling with can i have she sounds like an honest evolved person can she have a relationship with somebody um without that honesty because it sounds like she was trying to be say like listen like if i i want to have a relationship with you how can i have a relationship with you what do you need what do you need but she then you know she also has the right to have expectations and boundaries of that relationship too so she could just say listen in the future you know, how do you want me to respond, if at all, to you saying something I don't agree with? Uh huh. But I also I want the ability to say, you know, I don't agree with you. Yeah. And how can I do that without having something like this happen in the future? I was in a relationship once where we we couldn't we didn't fight not fight things would it, things would escalate that like you were saying that should never have gone outside the like the bounds of. Oh, really? I, I see. I don't agree. I see things differently. Whatever it was, if it was so-and-so is, is the most uh, talented musician, is, more, is a more talented musician than, than this person. Oh, really? See, I don't agree. I think this, it would escalate needlessly. It, we couldn't have, and I say we, I, I had a hard time not being able to have disagreements. And so I'm sure I had a reaction to when sh- she, to her reaction. Well, I, I, you, you always, you know, then it would become, you always have to be right. Then it would be about being right. And I would say, well, this is just my opinion. I, I did. And, and we couldn't uh, disagree. And it always, it was very like, um, and this is somebody that I met, I think this is a 
better overall point is that we we got into a relationship before we we were really around each other physically you know we we would i met her I, I, on like twitter basically you know and we would we would text with each other for the first few weeks and then you foment this you know it's deceptive and you get into this thing where it's like well i guess we're together now. and then you meet in person and there wasn't really all that much you know chem, like primal chemistry but it was like but we've been texting and sending these things and it's and we don't really like know each other fundamentally yeah and okay. then we, i'd stayed in that you know too long i don't know what How the, long? Two, like two years really <laughs> <laughs> yes a, a lovely person a wonderful person a person that i like and we're you know friendly now and things are good now but yeah, it was because uh, I've had relationships start online. I guess you could say, yeah. and you build that rapport, and it's yeah, it's a whole different type of different way of starting a relationship. It, it is, but if it didn't match my expectations in person, I I had I, a hard time saying no once it had already t t taken off, quote unquote. Once it had already and and that that sometimes happened before that happened in this case before we saw each other in person, and then it was like, man, I have a hard time saying no. I have a hard time disappointing, you know? So I was, <laughs> so which, which, I mean, the lesson is that's a never again. That's a, that's an example of a never again and, and never, definitely never again now because I, I've, I've found my person, but, but, um, you know, it's to, to, to spend time in any kind of, um, to struggling to make something work. Gotcha. I, I don't think I'll do that again. I have an answer for your question before uh -huh. we went back to the call when yeah. I knew with Natalie. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh, good. It was when she basically stop talking to me. <laughs> oh, I, I mean, well, you know, I, and I've talked about this, I was, yeah. you know, I was self-conscious about our age difference early on when we started dating and she was very adamant about us being together. And I was very resistant to, I, I, I was it just the social a aspect of it? No, that was, uh, it, no, it wasn't just that. Yeah. I honestly was just like, I, I, I did the optics. The optics were part of it, yeah. but I also was just like, I was genuinely worried about yeah. like, are we compatible? Enough? Yeah, that, that makes sense. You know, so I was just very resistant. I was very guarded and I, I just, I, I didn't even want to consider the possibility of us dating. So oh. I was very kind of closed off emotionally. Uh, and then she just started, you know, kind of setting up boundaries yeah. around me and, and um, she went on a trip and was less available and I, huh. I kind of panicked. Oh, interesting. I felt very 22 again. And yeah, and it was it, that. Because it was the not having her that, that started, not being yeah, with her. And then, you know, and then I kind of just thought to myself, well, and I, and I kind of try to take my own advice I often give to people like, what's, why don't I just try? Like, what's the worst that could happen? We could, oh, we would break up. That's yeah. the worst. Yeah. And like, that's not so bad. I've done that before. But yeah. why am I not at least giving this very special person a shot? But the idea of, you know, it was very juvenile of me, but yet, nevertheless, it was that moment where I, I, I think up until that point, I, I wasn't even willing to give it a shot. Huh. So I was very kind of closed off to it. So I think that's kind of why I, I had a, the reaction I did, which is I, I felt very out of character for where I was in my life. Hmm. And I felt like 22 year yeah, old me. Yeah. And I think it was because I was- You were I, wobbly. You, you didn't feel- Well, I, I didn't even, I wasn't- I wasn't even tapping into my emotions when it came to us. I was very closed yeah. off. I was like, no, I just said no to myself constantly. And so, and so it was when she said, she said no to you that you had to really examine what you wanted. Yeah. Yeah. And did you find that the, your age, your age difference, was it, did it, did it come into play afterward? Have there been moments where you felt a, a real like divide since then? And you, something definitely you moments, about. but yeah. there'd be more moments. Yeah. It's not something I feel like our relationship has to deal with on a regular basis. And does it have to do more with like references or more superficial things or like emotionally, um, is it, is there compatibility that, that, uh, yeah. it, that, that, that you don't question? Where, where I don't feel like it's something that bothers us, emo like affects emotionally. us emotionally. Yeah. But I, you know, and she's, you know, we do therapy and, and things like that. And, um, and what's the most common point of, disconnect in therapy or yeah, is, we just more do it to stay connected yeah so yeah. there's not really to learn tools to like yeah, communicate yeah. and yeah understand each other and yeah things like that like kate had a i remember early on one of our moments of disconnect was that she she's a such a generous person and i have a very hard time receiving things i have a hard time like my my um 
it was Father's Day the other day. My, my dad, we gave my dad some gifts and he was opening them. He's 84. And my mother was like, oh, this is too much. You know, you, you spent, you know, and it wasn't, it, it, the presents weren't like crazy. It was like he was getting a bottle of whiskey that wasn't like top shelf, but it was, he likes the, you know, the brand. And, and she was like, oh, honey, I, when I was growing up, I felt when I was opening, opening gifts at Christmas, I felt such, I wanted all these things and I was, and, and I had them on my list to send. And then when I would get them, especially after I learned about my parents' involvement in Christmas, wink, wink, I would get very like guilt ridden. I would be like overwhelmed with guilt and I would cry. It's too much. You did Because I knew my, my parents also weren't like, I didn't grow up with money and, 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 but they were generous. And so they would give us stuff when they could. And, but I would, I would have such guilt. So, and Kate loves to give things. She's an amazing gift giver. She, she just, like I said, took me on like fulfilled a childhood dream for my last birthday, taking me on this trip. And, but in the beginning I had to, um, I had a real reaction when she did things for me. She, she set up, I, remember I was hung over one day in, in Florida and she got this, this person to come to the house and, and give me like an IV and it was so generous. It was such a generous, thoughtful thing to do, but I started making jokes about it, you know, like, um, trying to, because I couldn't accept the gift, really. I, I felt uncomfortable. I felt like, and that was something that we had to, and it hurt her. It hurt yeah. her feelings, you know? And, and it was, she said, this like is dismissing a- dismissing it almost. Yeah, yeah, and it's a part of her. It's a very important part of her. It's something that she considers like, you know, it's, it's a, like a love language. Yes, totally. And so I had to learn to receive, you know, to receive that a little bit better. And, and it's just, and I love those moments of, I still have tinges of, she got me something the other day that was like, you know, I, I, I can feel it. I acknowledge it. I get anxiety with yeah. gifts sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder why. I mean, do you like giving gifts? Uh, better than I like receiving yeah, them. Yeah, me too. I feel like I owe, it's like I don't like to owe That's people. what it, that's, I think where it comes from. Because my mother, when somebody would give us something and, or invite us over for dinner, she would, her, she would go right, not to blame everything, <laughs> but she would go right to, oh no, now what do I owe? That's it's transactional. Sure. That's been a part of this process with, with Kate is being in a healthy thing is like just knowing that I don't have to, I can't, she's too good at giving gifts. I can't reciprocate, you know, perfectly when she gives me things like this. I, I can aspire to it, but it's also something that makes her happy. And so that's been a, a little bit of a, a, a journey. I, it's, I guess it's just how you communicate, how you move forward with somebody in a healthy way. Yeah. And it sounds like you are, and you have to be willing to do that. So it sounds like early on with Natalie, you were like, I'm not even willing to put in that kind of effort. I'm not, this is not the person I'm going to do that with. She's yeah. I just kind of said no. Dismissed it. Yeah. But then once I was, then I was all in. And, and had you ever done that before? Had you ever been all in like that in a really, it's kind of uh, like what she said to me, like I'm, in a really like a evolved way. I'm definitely in, when I'm in, I'm in. But is yeah. this new territory for you in terms of like connectivity? Yeah. 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 I've never had a relationship where we even thought about the idea of being connected. Mm. Mm. You know? Yeah, it's not interesting. Me where too. it was more like... This is just the thing we're in. When I was younger, yeah, it was just the thing we're in. And then it was like, are, are we more in love than our, uh, than our friends? You know? It yeah. was very juvenile where you could pair <laughs> relationships and, <laughs> yes. and stupid yeah. shit like that. It wasn't... Uh, the, the bond wasn't a thought. Like, uh, how, like, how connected are we? Are we a good team? Do we work through our issues? Or how, how do we make the other person feel good? And so when you asked her to marry you, was there any, was there a certain thing she did that, that, that you thought that triggered that decision? What did it feel like, now I feel secure within this? Uh, or it was just over time? I think it's more over time. Because yeah. once we started dating, it was kind of always in the back of our minds. Yeah. And after she gave, she left and gave you this kind of like, what, sort of an ultimatum. Yeah. yeah. How did you then con convince her? How did you communicate to, to her that you were going to give this a real shot? I asked if she would, if she still felt the way she did like a er, couple weeks earlier. Oh, it was and, weeks and, went by. Yeah. A couple weeks went by and, and then I asked her to come out to LA and, and, uh, that I would, I changed my mind and I hope that she would still be willing to do it. Huh. Yeah. Well, that, well, and it worked. It I mean, worked. that was how long ago? Like two years ago? Three weeks. Yeah, two or three years ago. Wow. Okay. Yeah. That's exciting. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so, so far, so good. So did, she wasn't subject to any of those, oh, Nick Vihal is this kind of guy. Like she, she, 
did her friends ha- had had I'm an sure, awareness? Yeah, of she's you? dealt with it, yeah. and like even on this podcast, you know, it's still ruffle feathers from time to time. So like she's she's become aware of of certain public perceptions of me out there. What, what was the last time you you would say you ruffled feathers? Probably last week. Uh huh. <laughs> what was it? What was the? I don't know. I mean, I don't. I I honestly don't pay too much right. attention to it. But when we cover we we cover The Bachelor or other reality TV shows, and part of it is to share opinions, opinions about. Yeah. And as much as we try to emphasize, we're not really talking about these people. We're talking about their, their, the behavior, the behavior. Yeah. 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 Literally. We, oh, we, we're, totally. we're yeah, acting the like behaviors that we show, but we don't know them and we, we recognize it's edited, but mm. nevertheless, uh, feelings are, can be, you know, people are sensitive. Do, do people on the bachelor reach out to you and, and complain about what you've done? No, yeah. no. Uh, but if I run them in person, they, they will sometimes act a little cagey around oh, me. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Every once in a while, but. It is. I'm excited for uh, Charity. It's a it's a great season. Yeah. Oh, I've yeah. seen the first two episodes. Oh yeah. Oh, she, I like her a lot. I, I think she is I'm excited. She's messier than I anticipated. And oh. I mean that in a great way. Hmm. It's only the first. It's early. Yeah. But as the family therapist that she is, oh, I right. I was concerned that she might be too level headed and, <laughs> and 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 too thoughtful. Yeah. And for. For, for fun good, TV, for, for good TV, yeah, yeah, and and so far she, or it's early. She's making some. Mis- she mis- seems to really be into someone that uh, I I think everyone's gonna fucking hate. Oh, that's interesting, and that makes for some oh, pretty yes. good TV. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Which, which which is so interesting. That happens with with friends and stuff. Like you, yeah. you, I, I and I again like when you're with when you when you're into somebody, you wonder how much of that is just. And I've thought that about past things. How much of it is just chemicals or they're fulfilling some psychological itch that I have that I need to, that I didn't work out with, with myself. How yeah. much of it? I, I heard this thing that they said, they said um, recently that butterflies are actually a, a sign that there's to danger. Bad, yes. Yeah. I didn't know yeah, that. Yeah. The spark, so the to spark. speak. Yeah. It's your, it's your body telling you yes. that it's something to look out for, not something to be drawn uh, that into. That blew my mind. I remember there was a line in, he's just not into you about the spark. And I yeah. say, it's advice that I give to a character. I say, the spark is bullshit. The spark is and I, I remember doing that scene and thinking, I don't know if I agree with this. A spark is, this feels like somebody writing and trying to sound a certain way. But but it turns out that that's true. It's true. Yeah. It's essentially your body telling you, you need validation from this yeah. person. And so instead of prioritizing, you know, characteristics that you probably would, huh. you know, tell, I want someone to make me feel this way. I want someone to make me feel that yeah. way. You're just, I, I want them to validate me. You completely change Yes. Uh, your behavior around yep. them yep. and your decision-making process and, I, and why you even want. I encountered this recently on, the, on our podcast, Life is Short. Uh, we, have, uh, we had Ellie Kemper on, the actress Ellie. Very funny and very smart. Um, she went to Princeton. She's just so quick, Ellie Kemper. She's from Bridesmaids. And, um, she was also uh, Unbreakable Kimmy Unbreakable Schmidt, Kimmy for Schmidt. anybody who's yes. wondering where you've heard that name before. She's great. She's got a new podcast, a double plug. She has a podcast about love, things that we love. She and, and her friend Scott, they talk about something that they love that happened that, w- that week and they have a guest on to talk about something they love and their guest was Bobby Bones I believe a g- really interesting funny he was on um, he's a, a, a radio personality oh he, was, he won Dancing with the Stars yes yeah. yes yeah. and he's an uh, American Idol yeah as yeah. well yeah he's and he was so interesting I found him really like sharp and, and funny and he's, he was talking about how his wife doesn't laugh at his his jokes anymore and, and, and it it really bothered him um and I remember being around years ago, being around Zach Galifianakis and his wa- now wife Quinn, and uh, and Quinn Zach said something funny, and and Quinn didn't laugh or shit, and I was like laughing so hard, and I and I said, I, and I and I it made me curious about their relationship and how what would it be like to be with such a funny person, and and, and I said Quinn, I noticed you weren't laughing or something like that, and Zach was like, she never laughs, she never laughs, so she she's a tough audience. But I could tell she enjoyed him. You know, I could tell she's like, I laugh when it's, you know, when it's warranted and I'm around him all the time. So it gets to be, and it made sense. It, it was actually kind of like charming and um, the way they dealt with each other. But Bobby had a real issue with his wife not laughing. And um, he said on, on this podcast that he started taking notes. <laughs> they would go out socially. Like uh, when, when, when he'd say something and it wouldn't get a laugh from her, he, he noted it. And he said afterwards, like, I think you should have laughed at this. And I and Ellie was curious about it. And I I was so fascinated by that. And I thought, what does that mean that that she does? She, and Ellie said, did she used to laugh? At, at, and, she, and he said, of course she did. Look at me. 
that's how I got her. You know, I'm, I'm funny. And she liked my sense of humor. I've been thinking about that a lot because I, I wonder what that means. Like, do we become complacent? Why would that something like that happen? And I, I've seen couples like that. I've seen couples like, oh, he never laughed. You know, she doesn't laugh at my stuff. Or there's or the things that gen- they seem genuinely no- annoyed by one another. But even com- comedians tell the same jokes. Mm-hmm. And I think when you just spend so much time with someone, you know, it's sure. like, I've heard this joke before. Nally will, I mean, I, re- you know, yeah, I, I'll tell a lot of stories. Yes. And so that's now what like, oh, here yeah. we go again yep. with this story, you know. And it's but there's just still, like, see, I, I've heard, yeah, not to be like, oh, superior, but like, I know Kate's heard almost all my stories. I've heard hers, but I still enjoy, I don't know, I enjoy hearing them. I enjoy hearing them tell them. But maybe it's, be- I don't know, maybe it's because it's relatively early and they- maybe at a certain point you yeah, become maybe. hardened to the stories. Uh, I don't know. But I took it as a sign of like, well, maybe, you know, not, not to diagnose this stranger, but I, I wonder if, if you lose, an in- if you wake up and you realize that there's, you've lost an enjoyment, like a really vital part of a relationship. Mm. It's kind of a scary place to be in, you know, sad. Yeah. I don't know. I don't want to be there. I don't want to be, you like, always find new ways. Well, why didn't you laugh at my joke? I don't want to be, you know, and I've been, I, I've, I've, yeah. I've never worked. Yeah. I don't think Nelly definitely doesn't laugh at all my jokes. Does it bother you? No. Yeah. Mm. Well, you're secure with it. Yeah. And she knows, you know that she knows you're funny. I don't think that's why she is with me though. But purely about your humor. Yeah. But it's a, but it's a, a reason. I don't know. Really? Yeah. Oh, oh that's surprising. You don't, I, really? I just, it's not a prerequisite for me. For someone, it's a bonus. For someone to if value. If I make her laugh, great. Yeah, but if, if, if I were to ask her, I'm about to meet her, if I were to say, what are, what are the top five things you, you really love about Nick? Would, would humor be? Maybe not. Oh, really? Yeah. But I think it's because I excel in other areas. Huh. Like, that's, I'm not judging. I'm, that's just me. I, that's an important thing for me. Like, I couldn't be with somebody who d- didn't really I think she me finds me I... more goofy than funny. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. She laughs at me, not with me. <laughs> But that's fun. I, I yeah, I'm fine with it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. She makes me laugh. She does. Yes. So it's important to you. It would seem like it'd be important. I would guess that it'd be important to you. Uh, I, sh- like top five. I think it was a uh, some. I it's important to me now with her because she makes me laugh so much. Yeah. She's the only girlfriend I've ever had that makes me laugh. Well, I, I think from just a outsider's perspective that, that there's probably a correlation there. And she she uh, she loosens me up. Yeah. She she she's very good at helping me with all my bad habits. Uh, that's great. Yeah. That she makes you better. Yeah. Yeah. I I feel the same without having to say that like a cliche. I know. But yeah. but the clichés become like kind of romantic because yeah. I I find that about music too. I listen to music now and I, there's songs that I love, even ones that I haven't heard in, in 20 years be, have a new life because of because of Kate, you know, I, I, they, I, I, I like that. I like when cliches kind of become real. I, it's interesting to me what, what you value in somebody. I, I, humor to me is so important that I, I, I think there were moments with Kate early on where we were we just had friends and I thought, oh, I, what a great new friend, you know, and this is somebody, and I hadn't really had this in a long time where I, she, it seemed, it felt like hanging out with a friend. It felt like, and I, I know that's what it's supposed to be, but it, I, I, it was a kind of a foreign feeling to me that it, it felt like you know, we watch football together and laugh, you know, and I do that with my friends. And now it's, I had never found that really, you know, somebody who really makes me laugh. We, we, we fucking, yeah, we laugh like idiots. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't think I valued it as much until I had it. So yeah. hopefully, and I'd never not work out where I would, but I, I would, if I had to find love again, yeah, then it would probably it would be higher. Kevin experienced it with Natalie. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure you would know really what filled you, what 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 you valued. Yeah, and what you needed in another person. Yeah, because she, yeah, she's she just levels me out. That's and great. I need to be. That's great. Yeah. I wish she's oh, man. You can't ask for a lot more than that. Yeah. To be better, because uh, and I I found that being alone um, afforded me the ability to, 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 to get to a good place with, with another person. Because I, I would think, well, I'm happy alone. You know, I don't need to be with somebody else. So it's, yeah, it's, it's a nice perspective to have. 
I got, I hope they get there. You know, I, I know how hard it is to, to not be with, uh, I'm so close with my brother. I know how hard it is to, to not be aligned w with a sibling, you know. It seems like he's tough. It does, doesn't it? Yeah. It sounded like the brother didn't really want to go there, but he was like, yeah, reluctant to, to really participate w with his older brother. Yeah. yeah. Justin, I can feel like we could talk for hours. I know, I know, I know. We're, we're getting... Now we're going off. So, we haven't even mentioned that you're our 600th episode. You are I know, our 200th guest. 600. I, I know. Way I know. to bury the lead, Justin. You're a, a, no. a congratulations. No, it's, it's, no, yeah. congratulations. We'll be hitting our 700 sooner than later. But 600. I love that you have been part of two uh, kind of anniversaries for Me us. too. I'm, yeah. I'm flattered you wanted me on. You're, such you're, a, you've become a big part of our show. I love. Uh, our audience loves you. I love being being a part of it. They're just so excited that you, you come. They ask for you all the time. Oh, that's. You yeah. guys. They really do. Get out of here. Sadly, we have to let you yes. go. Yeah. Yes. Good. It's so great talking to you, you, man. Always. And, yeah. I, and it's so good to hear you're so happy. Oh, likewise. And, and yeah. everything's great. And yeah. Are we, do we get to see you in some upcoming projects? Oh, let's see. Um, yeah. Uh, Goosebumps. Did you read Goosebumps? When yeah. Because I just missed them. I was just a little too old for, for the books, R.L. Stein books. Um, at Disney Plus, uh, we did the Goosebumps series in... We shot in Vancouver last year. I, I just saw some of it. It looks really, really good. Kind of like a, check that out. Yeah, in October. Uh, uh, I've heard rumors of Dodgeball too. Mm. It's funny. I ran into Vince, Vince Vaughn the other day uh, at a hotel we were both staying at, and um, it, was, it was sweet. Got to see his kids, and he. I asked him about it, and he said, "Well, well, Jay Long caused such an uproar on on the internet. You caused uh, quite a." quite an uproar on the internet by talking about it. And so I think it, it, <laughs> so he kind of blames me for uh, it, the resurgence of interest, I think. And, um, but yeah, it sounds like he is doing it. It's there's, they have a, they're writing a script. Uh, Are you? I don't know. I don't know. They haven't said. What the fuck? I don't know. He said he, I think it, I don't know if it's the same team. I don't know. He didn't say much about it and I didn't want to, I assumed, but maybe I don't want to be let down. So I don't want to be attached to it. Well, I'm emotionally hope. attached to I, it. I mean, I, I, I hope it would be fun because it was um, such a, I, it was 19, it came out, you know, every once in a while I get tagged on a thing on, on uh, Instagram where it was like, you know, 19 years ago, a movie came out a certain number of years ago and he said it came out 19 years ago the other day. Holy shit. I know. I know. And it was just such a, it, it brings me right back whenever I see that movie's on TV, if I, if I happen upon it or um, it brings me back to such a such a fun time in life i don't know if you can i don't know if you can recreate that i know and i'd already said this on a podcast which is why it kind of started getting talked about but i think ben was a little squirrely about doing a second one after uh, he's and he said this after after zoolander you know what happened with that and um so i don't know i don't know if he's gonna i don't know i like zoolander too uh, yeah you know i did too yeah i did too i liked anchorman too i'm a sucker for those movies but um I, I hope, hope you guys bring it back. I hope you're a part of it. I, I would love it if it's done in the right way, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Cause it's also a special thing. It's like, you don't want to, you know, you don't want to do sh shit. I on. feel like you'd all figure it out. Yeah. You're all talented enough. Um, so hopefully that happens. Yeah. Well, Justin, again, it's been a pleasure. Yeah, Thank oh, you always. for being a part of 600. Thank and, you guys. Uh, also check out Justin's podcast. Life's short. Yes. Right? Life is short. Life is short. Um, it's every, every Tuesday and then we have an episode called life is shorter, where it's just, uh, me and my brother shooting the shit on Friday. Amazing. Yeah. So fun. It's well, been... thanks guys for listening. Thanks as always of being part of our show. Uh, it, we wouldn't be here without you guys, as we mentioned, uh, can't wait till we do 600 more. So make sure to send in those questions at ask Nick at the vowelfiles.com for all things ask Nick and, uh, yeah, bye. Hey guys, if you loved what you listened to, make sure you hit that subscribe button below. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.